Assalamu alaikum guys, welcome to episode 167 of Freshly Grounded uh, This episode is with Ismail, a graduate of the University of Medina A brother who has, subhanAllah, um, really I believe kind of rejuvenated and uh, renovated in a way the way that the Qaeda is taught to the children in a way which is so seems so fun, so engaging, where the children love it. Uh, they love their teacher. They love going to the madrasa. And we're going to hear a lot about that. Um, and we're also going to hear a bit about Ismail's journey. Uh, before I talk about Ismail's journey, though, uh, I just want to let you guys know that, um, as you know, we are currently uh, helping Human Appeal raise funds for... Uh, the coronavirus and, and and what the money goes towards that you guys donate is one of two things. Either it goes towards helping uh, provide uh, food packages to vulnerable people in the UK uh, and that costs £15. And secondly, uh, what the money can go towards is a hygiene pack, which is £70. And that, what that hygiene pack does is it provides these emergency kind of packages to people around the world in countries like Pakistan, Yemen, uh, Iraq, etc. Uh, and... Um, provides these people who don't have access to these uh, basic necessities uh, with a pack um, so that inshallah we can help towards um, reducing the chances of them kind of getting the virus or spreading the virus and so a very very cool cause and if you want to go help out just go to justgiving.com forward slash um, freshly grounded covid19 I'm actually just waiting for Ismail to join this uh this podcast so if he joins kind of halfway through it'll be uh, halfway through the intro it'll be funny but um, before he does join, I'm quite glad that I am shooting this intro in advance because I imagine that it will be tough to record it after. I know very little about Ismail's story, but what I do know, okay, he's looking to join the chat, but I can admit him and or not admit him. So I'm going to quickly say what I do know is um, I came across Ismail's work uh, with his madrasa online and then... Um, you know, scrolling through his page, um, found out that he had been battling cancer and um, Alhamdulillah, the cancer seemed to have gone away. And this is this is Ismail's story. And, and like I said, I haven't heard it yet. And I'm going to be hearing it for the first time with you guys. And uh, he's told me, um, Faisal, um, I am allowing you, you have full permission of mine to go as deep as you as you wish. Um, so... Uh, ask anything and if there's anything that I feel like I don't want to answer I'll let you know but uh, you know everything's on the table and he's never shared his story before on a public platform um, so uh, inshallah this is probably going to be a really emotional uh, heavy podcast and um, and that's why I'm glad I'm shooting the intro in advance because I don't know if I would be in a you know Ready to ready to shoot an intro after 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 hearing this um, episode, and we make du'a that Allah gives uh, Ismail full shifa, and uh, Allah continues to bless him and puts barakah in his work, and uh, gives him good in this life and the next, protects his family, blesses his family, and grants them all jannah al firdaus, and uh, removes the hardship from them. Amin. All right, guys, let's get into this episode because Ismail is on the other side of this intro, waiting to enter the podcast. Let's let him in. Oh, I don't know how. Here we go. Admit. And welcome to Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I welcome. I said welcome to Freshly Grounded. No, after that bit. The brand new podcast. And after that bit. By best friends Faisal and Sam. Really? Fine. So, um, alhamdulillah, we're both on air. So we'll start with the salams. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, akhi. How is everything going, man? How, how are you keeping with regards to the fact that um, you're keeping your you're, you're indoors mm -hmm. uh, right now, have been probably for about a week or two? Yeah. And it looks like mm -hmm. today, as of today, which is Thursday, mm -hmm. the government uh, are likely to announce uh, today at five ish mm -hmm. that there's going to be an extension of about another three weeks. Allahu Akbar. On top, on top of the three months. No, no, no. So right now the um, the general the general lockdown was three weeks for oh. people who like for the layman, Got unless you. you have pre pre existing conditions. Got you. For which for which case it was three months. Yes, yes, um, 
but I think it's going to be extended again mm. um, today. The, the 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 weekly one, yeah. So so That's how are you keeping, man? Keeping yourself. I indoors? mean, regarding uh, how am I keeping with this whole lockdown? Because my lifestyle actually is so busy, so hectic. For me to be in a situation where I'm forced to be at home was good from the angle of that. You know, I can work on what I need to work on. You know, being so busy, taking the kids to school, picking them up from school, traveling to and from work, that takes up a lot of my time. So being at home from that angle is lovely. And also from another angle, and I mentioned this in the lesson uh, recently, on average day, from when I wake up to when I go to sleep, you know, and in between that, dropping the kids to school, picking them up, going to work, I probably have three hours, hardcore contact hours with my kids. And that's, uh, that's me stretching it. When you wait, when you when you factor in what time they get up to pray for Fajr, what time they by the time they leave your um your your, uh, your company when you drop them to school, then when you collect them, and if you're like me who works in the evening given classes, I only have from after school to when I have to leave to go to work. Oftentimes about six or six thirty. So when you think about the first hour and a half in the morning to the the next say hour and a half just before I have to leave for work again, that's three hours at most. You know, and then when I come back from work, they're sleeping. You with me? So mm. it's um, this has been nice because I think not just myself, a lot of people now have been forced to come together, spend time, actually get to know, get to know you, <laughs> get to know your own kids. Do you know what I mean? Sorry. You know, Sorry. find out which ones are the mischievous ones, which ones <laughs> are not there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, that's been nice, and um, you know, actually, I'm 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 a big advocate of you know how you choose to look at a situation and by no stretch of the imagination do I want anybody to understand from me that um, I'm saying that yeah, let's look at COVID-19 it's, it's a good thing no it's, it's, there's definitely negative elements to it people are dying people are becoming sick my good friend you've probably seen uh, the Medina documentaries or if you haven't you know a lot of people did when it came out by uh, Rosat Islam about 10 years ago now my good friend Abdul Hakim he's in the hospital, as we speak right now, Charlotte Ali is coming out today, mm -hmm. and he was diagnosed with COVID uh, nineteen. Um, so it's like it is. It's 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 a serious uh, pandemic, but at the same time, I believe that how we, as human beings, specifically as Muslims, choose to look at a situation will dictate how we navigate through that trial. And undoubtedly, inshallah ta'ala, when we get onto my cancer story, you know, I'll try to the best of my abilities to share some. Um, like an insight into how I start, how I looked at it when I first got diagnosed. I'm talking about literally, actually, when a doctor just said to me, like he, he gave me the, I can't remember verbatim right now what I said to him, Shalat will come back to me. But from that moment, how I felt, up until when it actually sunk in, up until when I was at my lowest, and then, you know, where I am today. So um, if we can try to control the way we look at situations, all right? Looking at the cup as half empty, uh, sorry, as half full, as opposed to half empty, that will help us. So um, this COVID-19 is a, a terrible um, situation, but at the same time, there is a lot of good, you know? There's a lot of good that has come about. Maybe, wallahu a'lam akhi, maybe we wouldn't be doing this. Um, we wouldn't. We might not be doing this right now. We would have yeah, probably said, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. let's link up in the studio, and that might have been pushed back to one, two years. Do you know what I mean? But Akhi Face, I wanted to it's say true, something. Man. I'm so sorry. I meant to start with this. I wanted to thank you, you know, on air, live, sure. for um, this opportunity. Uh, it does really mean a lot to me. I know I've said it to you off camera, but I, I do want to say it on camera too. And secondly, um, you know, for everybody that's going to be watching this, I do appreciate it. Bro, we're going to be... Uh, I'm so grateful to you. As you know, I've been chasing you for a minute. Uh, I, I'm grateful to you that you've given us your time. Not only have you given us your time, uh, I know that you haven't shared your story um, on a public platform like this before. And so for allowing um, our viewers to benefit and myself to benefit, you know, when I have these conversations uh, with people... We've done over 160 episodes now and I feel so blessed that... Um, I feel so blessed that I am the one who gets to have a conversation with these amazing individuals that I can learn from, sure. that I can uh, under hear their stories mm. firsthand. Because, bro, we're in a day and age now where how often can you sit with someone for an hour and a half and just chat so, without yeah. phones, actually, without so. uh, distractions, without your kids running around, just you having a face to face conversation or or, or face to uh, face to video conversation That's it. That's it. Uh, as, as mm. is today? Um, let, let, let's talk a bit about uh, let's talk a bit about your. Um, uh, about your journey of starting with uh, Little Mesur. Sure. 
So I, I I can't remember exactly how I came across your content, bro. But I believe inevitably it would have it was definitely on Instagram, and inevitably it would have been because we have our, um, you know mutual uh, friends, mutual uh, kind of companions. Um, uh, and so something would have been shared and I ended up clicking on your profile. And to be honest, bro, um, I didn't know about your uh, journey with cancer at that time. Okay. Uh, what I did what I did uh, know, though, is as soon as I just saw your content and I saw the video, I remember one specific video, actually, and you was you were teaching the children. Um, I think you were teaching them how to pronounce words we when or, or or like two letter words yeah. when when they when they end with a sakun so you were saying like okay. you know yeah. uh alif fatas like uh, noon sakun and then they say and do you remember that video yeah, yeah, very well. so actually when i saw that and i'm and i'm watching it and you can't even see the children but you can see how you can hear how engaged the children are and to be uh, subhanallah i was i was amazed and i was thinking to myself that um you know when i was younger so we never went to a madrasa, but we did go to uh, for a very short period of time. We went to we did go to a madrasa for for a very short period of time. Maybe uh, I, I can't even remember how long. I, I have vague memories of it in my, in my for my childhood, um, which shows kind of a how young we were and b how little of a time we went for. And I never remember it being like that. I never remember being excited to go. I actually remember being scared. I would see. I remember I would see that. Um, I'll see that teacher sometimes on the road, on the road, yeah. And I would want to, I would like, I would like duck my head and be like, ah, oh, drive faster because I don't want him to see me. And Subhanallah, when I was watching your video, it seemed like the children couldn't get enough. Wow. And I thought to myself, Subhanallah, it's like the brother has renovated, like the teaching of the qaeda and the teaching of the uh, Quran to the children. And so then I, that's when I started following and I started watching your content and stuff. So. Um, is that true? Do the children really love coming to to, coming to school? And and how, and how did the journey of little Mesur, um start? Where, where did it kind of begin? Was it before or after your sure. your, your time at Medina? Sure. sure. All right. I'll answer your first question first, and I'll jump back to where it actually it began. Um, I would like to think you know that the children enjoy themselves. You know, it wouldn't please me to know that um kids are coming spending their time, uh, which is valuable. Uh, parents are also spending their money and their time commuting back and forth, uh, it's a big commitment, huge commitment. And on top of that, they're putting their trust in Meso or Little Meso, you know? So um, we try to go above and beyond the call of duty in ensuring that the kids enjoy themselves and the parents are getting value for money because at the end of the day, you know, it is a business. Um, but at the same time, it's not just a business, you know? We're doing this because we want to leave a legacy. We want to leave a, you know, um, a brand that's timeless you know you mentioned a very interesting point you said that when you were young you don't remember it being like that all right you don't re or when you as you grew older you'd see your the ustad or um whoever on the on the on the roads and you're you're doing all of this that's natural you know um but i th i i think about those things now so for example the kids five six seven years old that we're teaching now i think about when you're go soon, you're going to be 17, 18, 19. And I'm going to, inshallah, if Allah gives me life, I'm going to be the old and grey one that's walking down the road, maybe with my walking stick. And I don't want that child, I don't want to create those memories in that child to be doing like this. You with me? I want to create those memories where they see and good emotions are e e evoked. All right? And the way to do that, in my humble opinion, is to give them long-lasting memories that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. So when they think back to Quran, Arabic, Islamic studies, or even how they viewed the older, <clears throat> the older generation, I want positive things to come to mind. So I try to have that mindset moving forward. And, you know, I'm not the best Arabic teacher in the world or the best teacher. I'm not the most funniest person or the most, you know, engaging uh, teacher, the most organized. But, but, أخي, in my humble opinion, you'll be hard pressed to find somebody that's gonna be more passionate than me. And that's not something I say uh, as a brag, that's just me just being real, you know? I teach with a passion. I encourage my wife, who's a co-founder with Little Mesor and Mesor, um, to teach with passion. Uh, any teacher, we've got another teacher, mashallah, her name's uh, Ustada Firadosa, fantastic teacher. You know, and it was so organic how she came a part of this uh, situation. She teaches with passion. And I find that you don't always have to be the best, you know, as long as you're what you're doing, you're, you're staying true to yourself and you're teaching and you're doing the very best that you can do. You know, you're trying to ascribe perfection 
in what you do, then you're onto a winning streak because eventually it's going to reach somebody's heart. You with me? I've been doing it for 10 years, Akhi. And I've had, I've been doing it for 10 years, Akhi. I've had these um, emotions of like, why ain't people like really re uh, re re um, being receptive to this? And, you know, um, I've had all of that. I've had uh, thoughts about, should I just pack this in and go down another career path? You know, I've had all of that. In fact, just before we jumped online, I was tidying up my library because I wanted it to be presentable for this interview, right? Um, and I came across... I saw you with the duster in your hand. Yes, all of that, actually, the pink and, <laughs> pink and yellow and blue, right? Um, yeah, so I came across a book and I wrote this book. Sorry, I didn't write it. It wasn't a book that I wrote. I just adapted a previous book, right? And it was a book that we studied in level number one of the Arabic Institute. Achi, I was there 10 years ago. I was there 10 years ago. And so, so, so coincidentally, the book that I adapted was the book that I'm actually teaching right now for free. It wasn't planned. It just, it's just how it happened organically. So I'm teaching this book that we, that we study in uh, level number one of the Arabic Institute called al Qira, which is all about reading. And that was the book that I decided out of all of the Medina, uh, sorry, out of all the books that we studied in the, the Institute, that was the one book I chose to adapt. And what did I do? I basically got all of the, the, the verbs, right? Anyone that's studying Arabic will understand what I'm speaking about. All of the verbs that are um, conjugated into, for example, the present tense plural or the past tense singular feminine, that you can't find these words in a dictionary. I richly wrote all of the past tense, present tense, command form and what we call the master, the verbal noun at the bottom of the page. And the reason why I did it was because when I was studying Arabic many, many moons ago, this was something that I found difficult. If I came across a word like, for example, ja'u at-tulab, ja'u, giving you a little Arabic lesson now, by the way, um, uh, Faisal, free of charge. Majana, ma fi mushkila. At-tulab, at-tulabu, ja'u min bilad al-mukhtalifatin. For example, I say, okay, I'm going back 10 years now. I say, I know what at-tulab means. That means the students. What does ja'u mean? All right, let me go look it up in the dictionary. And I'm flicking, 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 flicking through the dictionary actually until my dictionary now looks like, now looks like oh, this today. Okay. It's filthy, pages gone, you know, I've got sellotape at the bottom. And that tells a story though, actually, it's good. It's a story and this is why I've never got rid of it. As, 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 I mean, I've got other dictionaries that you can see in the back here that are pristine, but this one has sentimental value. This is where the journey for me all began and this represents um, growth. This is something that I'm going to say to my boys, listen, Bismillah, you have to use this same dictionary when you're going on your journey. Anyway, um, I said all of that to say this, that um, you can't find the word ja'u in the dictionary. You have to have the, the skills and the ability to strip that verb down so it coincides with the singular, masculine, third person um, past. Once you've done that, now you can find it in this dictionary. I found that book today, Akhi. Jazakallah khair for encouraging me to tidy up my, my, my office. I found it and then I just post, posted a video up online and I was showing them, like, I said, guys, I'm actually teaching this book right now live I'm, uh, for, for, for you guys to benefit from. Look at how I was annotating on this book when I was um, in Medina. So I found the book that I actually studied and then I found the other book that I adapted when I put all the verbs. And, uh, it's, some, it's floating around somewhere behind me. I can't see it at the moment, but um, I need to release that actually because that is over 10 years old and the benefit that students that are at the beginning, the infancy stage of studying Arabic will benefit from it is going to be immense. Be idhni lahi ta'ala. So, so how old are you? Because you're talking, to, mm. you've been um, teaching for 10 years and yeah. Allahum barik, you look very, very young. Barakallahu fi akhi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep me looking this way and uh, may I Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you as well. How old am I? How old would you give me, akhi? I'll say 33. 33. You're not too far off the mark. I'm, I'm 35. Okay. I'm 35. I say 33 because I know the people that you know, that you know and stuff and so Gosh. I know you're around the same age group as them brothers Gosh and stuff. So I, I I used a bit of wisdom with that. I'm not saying that you look 33. And no, I appreciate that man. I appreciate that. But yeah, 33 uh, sorry, 35 years old. Um um yeah, so that was the um that's that, that was the interesting thing about um you know uh, what happened earlier on before we uh, So 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 sorry to stop you there but you you mentioned uh, little Mesur and Mesur. Sure. So, so what's the difference between the two? Excellent. All right. So now let me um, go back to the beginning where it all began. 
When I first went to Medina, Akhi, I had some basic survival sentences, so I knew how to uh, get around at a very, very basic level, right? I had already done like Medina book one online and, and, some, and some different masajid and whatnot. But um, my Arabic wasn't at the level whereby I could communicate easily. So when I got accepted to Medina, um, I found it very difficult, as you can imagine. You go in there, you know the Arabic alphabet, you can read, but you have absolutely no listening skills, all right? And you're being taught all in Arabic. It is probably, you know, single-handedly one of the most <laughs> frustrating experiences ever to, be, to have to sit in a class for a couple of hours and the teacher's talking and you don't know if you're understanding what they're saying or not. So from that frustration, that's how Meso was born, if you like. Meso was primarily or is primarily a, um, an online institute. And obviously we've got some um, cases where we've, we've branched out to teaching physically now. But it's been set up to teach non-native speakers the Arabic language in a nutshell. And... One of the things that I, I really want, you know, my students and anybody that's on, you know, that's connected to my outreach and even your listeners now to, 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 to know is that um, beautiful things, wonderful things can be created from either trauma. It can be created from severe frustration, you know, just because you're going through a traumatic experience or a devastating time in your life or a, um, you know, a, a testing time or, you know, you're struggling to do something. We have to learn just to trust the process, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take the, the necessary means, but also believe in your heart that this doesn't have to be bad. You know, something beautiful can come out of this. And off the back of me struggling and feeling frustrated in class for, I don't know how long it was, maybe like a year or so, I said to myself, you know what? I want to teach. I don't want people to go through what I'm going through right now. You with me? I want mm -hmm. people to go through this. I'm going to try to share this you know, with the world, i.e. the Ummah, in a way that's digestible, in a way that's easy to understand, in a way that's comprehensible, in a way that's not going to make people run away from the, uh, the language. Because the reality is, nobody's stupid. It's just that some of us learn quicker than others. You know, you could teach a, a lion, you know, to open its mouth, put your head in it and not bite your head off. You can train an animal to do that. So I'm sure, surely you can train a human to learn how to um, understand, speak, read, right arabic does that make sense so that's when meso was uh, born and i initially started funny enough Akhi, um on facebook i remember facebook was out maybe like about three four years old uh, I, I set up a, a, an account called um at tulab al medina which grammatically i didn't know at the time was wrong we don't say at tulab okay. al medina you would say tulab al medina anyway we set up this uh, um, account or i did anyway facebook account and then i would start sharing benefits start sharing benefits Around that time, Akhi, remember I was in the first, um, I was in my first level in Medina. So 2009, 2010 times, um, I came across Khan Academy. And probably everybody knows what Khan Academy is, an online site that teaches everything that you need to know for like secular studies mainly. And even stuff outside of, you know, the traditional secular um, study, uh, topics that we study in school. And I was blown away. I was like, this is fantastic. Like, you're at home. And you can get a decent or a very, very good education by just being at home. It, it just blew my mind. So I remember saying to a brother at the time, Achi, how does he do what he's doing? Meaning, how is it that I'm watching him right on his screen? That blew my mind at the time. You know, that blew, Achi, it literally blew my mind. Because I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, I can just pretend that's so bored and teach Arabic. So he said, oh, you need a tablet. And I'm like, well, what's a tablet? A trial whack on tablet went online found a whack on tablet remember these times i'm in medina so i found a whack on tablet but we don't have no amazon or ebay just to deliver something to medina so i literally had to get somebody in the uk to get the tablet and send it over to the, uh, the saudi and you can imagine that the time delays i have to get yeah. the product wait for somebody to come and then meet that person but when you got it in your possession Achi, it's like a, a bar of gold you know it's like oh yes and at the time i had an old toshiba laptop you know, I would, um, I put my family through some stress, man, because when I was recording, we had a little place in Medina at the time. We had, I think I had about two children at the time. And that's another story that we can go into, um, you know, the, the heart-wrenching decision we, we made to leave one of our kids back in the UK. I don't know, maybe, the, Allah Akbar. Yeah, maybe that might be a, a conversation for another day, or maybe it might organically just fit into what we're speaking about. 
But needless to say, I was using the old Toshiba laptop and I would say to my wife, guys, stay in the back, I'm gonna record. I would hear a door slam or, the, I'm, so, I'm like, be quiet. My wife would be like, how much longer are you gonna be? You're taking ages. I'd be like, five minutes, five minutes. Three hours later, I'm coming, trying to sneak in the bed, you know? I have memories of that. When I think of Mesor, that's how it started to me. The majority of people, you know, even yourself, for example, you said that the first time you came across Mesor was me in a classroom just being all interactive. For my wife, <laughs> she has a completely different perception, you know? She sees the growth. She sees the days where I said I'm gonna be five minutes and I'm coming back in the, back in the bedroom three hours later. Or, you know, be quiet because I need to do it. I'm, I'm recording. She's gone through all of that frustration. So um, one of the, the challenges I found at that stage, Achi, was that whilst I was given the lessons, they were good. They were getting really fantastic views online. I had this like traditional green board. I would write on the, uh, the tablet that I had and then it would appear on screen um, but the computer didn't have the ability to handle the graphics what I was or the the, uh, the, uh, the the end result that I was trying to achieve you with me so I was like well I'm a, 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 what's the what's the solution do I stop and say Khalas, this is it's not working out I don't have the correct um, the tools that I need I said no I need to get another computer <laughs> I need to get a computer. So that was, I think, okay. the, yeah, that was the first time actually I, went, I, I delved into the world of Apple. And they, since they've got me, they, ever since actually they've got me by the choke, I am Apple. Yeah, same here, bro. Actually, Apple through and through. Choice. You know, I went, I, I, I betrayed them a little bit. I went to Samsung for a little while and I said, nah, I went back to Apple. You know, so I've got my. Because yeah, once you're in the once you're in the family of Apple, yeah, everything's integrated. They lock you in because That's your it. phone starts talking to your laptop. Your laptop talks to your iPad. That's your it. iPad talks to That's your it. headphones. Like, it's and just too it. much. I, 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 the thing yeah, is, yeah, I love it from, from a business perspective. I love it. I mean, the the, the product is fantastic. The quality is you know second to none in my opinion. But I like the mindset. It's a bit. It's a bit. Um, treacherous to a degree. It's like halas. Like let me go now, but I can't. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, stuck yeah, with yeah, you for yeah. life. But I like the fact that it, it does, in a, in, a, in a weird way, I suppose, create customer loyalty. And that's what I would love for um, the children of Little Mesa or the parents of Little Mesa and the children of Little Mesa and also those um, students that are connected to Mesa. I also want them to have that connection. You know, it's not just a company where we're making money. You know, it's not about that. It's never been about that. Is it important? Yeah, it is important because we are all human beings and we all have to survive. Right, we all want to, inshallah, ta'an anyway, leave a legacy. But what's important is that you're that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed me to be in a situation where I can give back. And walillah alhamd wa shukr, I have the ability to teach. You know, as a matter of fact, as it came when when before Meso became Meso as we know it today, Achi, Meso Arabic or Little Meso um, Academy. I was literally, I remember I was going through names. I came up with um, <clears throat> names like Ashab, <laughs> Ashab al Khair. Ashab al Khair means the companions of goodness. You could just see where my mind was at the time. And then my wife was like, nah, like, that's too heavy. It's too wordy. And you've got to think about who you're trying to reach out to. I'm trying to reach out to people that don't speak Arabic, right? How are they going to pronounce words like, oh, the letter, sorry, the letter like, oh, you know? They're going to start saying, Ashab al care, care, or something like that. And um, I always think about my mum, you know, how would she pronounce something? So I said, no, scratch that. I need a name that's going to be easy on the tongue, right? And anyone can pronounce it, whether you're an Arab or whether you're a non-Arab. And I kid you not, Akhi, as Allah is my witness, <laughs> I took this dictionary, I would walk to the masjid with this dictionary, and I would just flick. I'd just be flicking, flicking, and I'd say, nah, I don't like, nah, that's not... It wasn't, I wasn't actually going for meaning at first. I was going for what sounds good. And then, um, if I'm not mistaken, the chapter meme, yeah? The, when, you, when you're looking at words that begin with meme, for some reason, it's the biggest chapter in the dictionary, in this particular oh, really? dictionary. I don't know why it is. I don't know if that's a thing out there or it's something that I've just observed. But every time I get to meme, it's like it just doesn't end. And I flicked on the word mesor. And I was like, mesor, that, that, that's kind of easy. I think everybody can say that. There's nothing difficult in terms of the pronunciation of the letters that we don't have in the English language. And then when I looked at the meaning, I was like, khalas, that's a rap. Because the word mesor means to make things easy, accessible, oh, to make, really? thing, uh, make things feasible. And that wow. one word, my brother, it encompassed exactly what I was trying to do. Remember, I, I spoke uh, about my frustrations earlier. 
I spoke my frustration. So hey, my theory was that you named it Maysoor because you named it after maybe a child you have called Maysoor. Look at that, subhanAllah. No, that's not the case, man. I, I, I named it Maysoor. It was kind of just like the Qadr, you know, that uh, it just I came across this word sounding good and the meaning was also so good. So it's little Maysoor was born from Maysoor. All right. Hmm. I started from the the, the, the the green boards. And what happened was I was going through the Medina book series, just teaching it. Right. Similar to what I'm quite well known for today. Um, and I just couldn't sustain it. It was a passion. But you have to understand at the same time uh, as my, my uh, you got a passion. But I've also got a wife. You know, I'm living off of the equivalent of um, I think the the stipend that we were getting called Makafa was um, 840 reals at that uh, time. Which at the time, if I'm not mistaken, the exchange rate was about 140 pounds. It's not a lot of money, you know, when you think about rent. Whilst rent's significantly cheaper over there than it is here, it's still a lot to somebody that isn't making no money. I had to think about my studies. I had to think about, you know, my personal time and stuff like that. You've got your studies in the Jamia. And then you've got, which is something that I would love to speak about perhaps in another uh, podcast as well. You've got the, the pressure that some maybe to no fault of their own, that some students would put on you that you have to start attending durus outside, which in and of itself is a fantastic thing. Obviously, you know, we should be sitting with the scholars as, as students of knowledge anyway. But at the same time, we have to be um, honest and real with ourselves that if I've just come over to the country, right, um, and now I'm being quote unquote forced, I feel like I'm being like, there's that peer pressure for me now to go and sit in lessons that I don't understand a word that's going on, what's going to happen to the majority of us? We're going to be like, the next time, making up, ah, oh, you know what, um, my wife wants to go out, you know, I can't make it, all right, next one, oh, I'm not even feeling too well. And then you start to create a dislike for something which should be something that is um, an act of worship. So I think that the brothers, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of them good, um, they were just being zealous and eager and when inshallah ta'ala it was from wanting good for your brother what you want for yourself but sometimes in doing so if it's not applied correctly it can push people away um and i i, I, I won't lie I, I experienced that you know being again being frustrated but just being at the lesson because i feel like this is what i should be doing as opposed to me being there because i'm actually really benefiting that came for me personally in my journey much later on because it took me such a long time Achi, to acquire the skills where I, I felt comfortable, you know, sitting in a lesson. I mean, we were in lessons anyway for five hours a day. Anything else, at the time, it just felt like overkill. But um, anyway, that's how that's how Meso, um began. Um, then eventually, uh, I stopped the online videos and I went just missing in action for some time and I focused on myself. Um, again, there was so many things that happened whilst we were in Medina. Um, I probably think it would be better to speak about that on another occasion because that's a, a whole another drama and situation, you know. Yeah, man, I've seen I've seen like uh, students of knowledge and and and, and uh, you know various shiuks speak about their journey in Medina, mm. and uh, they deliver in like one hour, two hour lectures, some yeah. uh, series or just the benefits that they learned from from sure. from studying out there. So yeah, no, it'd be really um, good. So. Uh, so, so Mesur is uh, and little Mesur. Um, I, I'm assuming Mesur is uh, kind of primarily for adults and little That's Mesur for, for for children. That's absolutely um, correct. Alhamdulillah. And uh, so, I, I, when I was on your on the uh, Mesur Arabic page, oh, actually, by the way, before we move on um, to the next topic that I was going to discuss, sure. we should mention that. Um, uh, through Mesur Arabic, you're actually um, giving uh, uh, a uh, you're you're, kind of, you're delivering a course right now for people who are at home yep. in isolation who want to either uh, learn to am I right in saying learn to read uh, the Arabic language but also to uh, also vocabulary and stuff? What what is it that? Sure, that, that I mean that yeah, doing? that's absolutely correct. That book that I was speaking about earlier, Al Qiraa, that I came across that you know I, I modified ten years ago. Uh, we launched um, a give back campaign, and it was literally to give back to the people and it wasn't to necessarily get anything back in return we opened up the course absolutely free you know it was um we opened it up for 48 hours and in those 48 hours by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission and i've never experienced this type of traction in my life Echi. we had over 1700 people that opted in Allah for the course Akbar. in two days in two days wow. to the point where i was like wow i mean i was expecting 20 people um, and then I was like, okay, that's cool. 
um, I have to stop this. Uh, I have to close the the register free registration now, um, because I don't know if the platform that I'm using can even cater for these people. I knew that not one thousand seven hundred people will uh, turn up, but even if half of those turned up, that's still a lot of people. So I went onto Zoom and I checked out my subscription and I couldn't do it. I I'm paying for a hundred people or yeah hundred people. So I was like dilemma again. It just it, what I want people to learn from this is that when you face a dilemma. Don't let the first choice or option be, Khalas, I can't do it. Sorry, guys, I can't do the lesson no more. Nah, find out what you have to do to make it happen. If you have to spend money, you have to spend money. If you have to put more time in, you have to put more time in. If you have to go and ask for a favor from somebody, you still there? Sorry, I got a, a, a call come through. No worries, no uh, worries. There we are. Yeah, um, I was saying... It's my mother-in-law, so I'm going to be in the naughty books uh, for declining uh, do, that call, maybe. Do you want to answer, Yaki? No, 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 it's okay, Yaki. Uh, so, yeah, so if you want to... Uh, if you want Whatever you have to do, you have to ask for a favour, go and ask for a favour. Just get the job done. So I'd done what I had to do, right, to ena enable 500 people. I thought, right, that's a, a decent amount. Um, so, yeah, that's the course that we're offering absolutely free, or we were or offering it for free. Um, but now it's that, 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 you know, that grace period, if you like, has, um, has closed. The course is still available and we're still doing live sessions. We're going to be finishing, inshallah, to next Tuesday. But it's actually now a, a chargeable rate on the www.meso.com uh, website. Um, and I don't want anybody th to think for a split second that because it's free, that means that there's going to be some uh, compromise in the value or in the attention to DL that I I try to uh, deliver when I'm giving the course. It's not like that at all. You know, my, my philosophy is this, right? If you're paying me for a lesson, uh, uh, it's possible that I may, after a while, get complacent. Even if you give me £50 an hour, after a while, £100 an hour, you give me £100 an hour. The first lesson, I'm going to give you my best. Second lesson, I might give you my best. But after a while, £100 an hour becomes the norm. Now, I, so, it's yeah. possible that I could start to slack in my delivery and how I and how I prepare for the lesson. So if you have the, the mindset, or, or I try to have the mindset, I don't always get it, but I try to have the mindset that I'm paying you for me to teach you. That's a completely different um, approach now. I'm going to make sure if I'm paying you for me to teach you, all right, and I'm looking at what I'm giving you, I want, I want to get value for that. I'm going to give my all. And I don't see it as you paying me. I see it as I'm paying you for, for your time. SubhanAllah. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of a brother who he was trying to, um, who, who, who we know, he was trying to for years, like he, um, you know, he, he, he came to, uh, to the deen and mm -hmm. he was trying, uh, he was a Muslim, but he, as in he started practicing, he was from a liberal household mm -hmm. and he, wa he really wanted to teach his family mm -hmm. uh, Quran. MashaAllah. And uh, for years, actually, and everything he tried, everything he would try, would uh, would not work. And uh, it wasn't. And then, and what happened is he was saying that he there was a sin that he finally managed to stop. That was, you know, it was reoccurring. You know, he would sin, he would make toba for it. He would, you know, sincerely, but come back to the sin eventually. Mm. And eventually, uh, he was able to, by the will of Allah. Um, Stop the sin Allah in its Allah. entirely, mm. and we ask that Allah allows him to to to, to, to remain steadfast. Allah yeah, Allah I mean, and Akhi, um, he has many siblings, mm. and by uh, and he was trying to just get one and then try and get the other and try and get the other, and he stopped the sin. And Akhi, in the same period of time, he all three of them he started being able to teach the Quran to in, in, in separate ways, they came. Did you say he had many siblings? Siblings, yeah. Your brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he was, and 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 when he stopped that sin, the barakah that came with it is that uh, they all, in individual, separate ways, yeah, uh, uh, wanted to learn Quran. Jamil, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I'll tell you why 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 the story links is because he was saying that. It's a blessing that because if you reflect on it, you'll think he, he that you might think to yourself, or a, a person might think to themselves, hold on a second, why is there a link between the sin and teaching Quran? Because it's not like it's a it's a it's a he just create it's created more work for him for him. He's got less time on his hands, but mm. he was saying that the fact that he is able to teach the Quran to his uh, family, yeah. the the, the nirma is that he, that the the. Re, 
the blessing that he is a- that he is able to be the one to teach them Lord, um that he is able uh, we know that Allah says save yourself and your family from the from the fire right no. and um and he is able Allah has blessed him with the ability to try and achieve the opportunity of of saving him, his family from the fire Beautiful. so one could look at it one could look at it from an aspect as you know of like you're saying that they are getting a benefit they are That's able it. to learn the Quran That's they're able to it. better their lives That's or you can look at it from the aspect of Allah has allowed me to to, to, to teach them and that is subhanallah beautiful. look at the mindset and that's that mindset sure. there it dictates how you how you uh, how you function you know it dictates right. also how you're perceived and that's another message subhanallah i took it away from i took it away from the the offer that the people have uh, for from Mesur Arabic. Say that again. There's gonna be a lot of people listening to this, and they want to pick up on on the Arabic. Akhi. That, I mean, that that'll be that be that would be khair al al khair. Akhi. That would be um a, a benefit. And it's just really, I'm really happy to hear that. Mashallah, tabarakallah, the brother, he used as uh, he 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 um he didn't fall victim to his circumstances. He didn't say as some people do say, I'm committing this sin. Uh, you know, Allah's not gonna forgive me. And start, you know, despairing and losing hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and continue down that destructive path. But he used that, let's call it a traumatic experience, all right, to bring about some good. And this is what I was alluding to at the beginning of this uh, conversation. Not everything that appears bad is bad. You know, be optimistic and try to um, search for the goodness in the evil. And that's a skill. Because oftentimes when the evil comes, we just see the evil. You just see the evil because it's just apparent. You have to search for the khair. Okay, how can I make the best out of a bad situation? You know, and also the fact that mashallah tabarakallah, this brother, you know, is, is doing something that's probably one of the most honorable, I'm going to call it a career path, but, you know, take that, 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 that term with a pinch of salt um, to, you know, he's giving back by teaching the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his family and hopefully inshallah ta'ala other people that is just an, an example of somebody you know trying to strive for al-ihsan and this is what al-islam as you know uh, uh, encourages the prophet alayhi salatu salam said in allah katab al-ihsana or katab al-ihsan ala kulli shay'in that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, prescribed and decreed perfection on everything you know, if you kill, then kill well. If you slaughter, then slaughter well. This is, the, this is what the hadith goes on to mention. And likewise, we should implement that same type of mindset in what we do. So if you're going to teach, then teach well. If you're going to give podcasts, give podcasts well. You know what I mean? If you're going to go into the charity sector, yeah. then do it well. Do it to the best of your ability. You know? So, so, so how can a person uh, how can a person now let's say they've missed that opportunity to sign up for the free courses yeah. how can they benefit from Mesur Arabic if they're in isolation right now and they want to use this time for sure I mean um, we still give like live classes twice a week at the moment we're going through um, the Prophet's Prayer described which I actually did yesterday which is every Wednesday about say, um, 7.30 from 7 or 7.30 I forget now and on Friday, we're going through another tremendously important topic called um, uh, the names and attributes of Allah. We're not actually studying each name and what does that name mean and what is the attribute linked to that name as such. Although it does come up naturally, we're more um, focusing on principles that Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul, uh, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Salih al mean Allah yarhamuhu, may Allah have mercy upon him. He wrote uh, these uh, these principles out as it relates to the names and attributes of Allah. So I'm going through that book at the moment. So these are the free content that anybody can benefit from. As it relates to those people that you know missed the opportunity to jump on the free reading course, then um, they can go to the site and there are um, you know there are offers and I hope inshallah ta'ala the courses are, are reasonably uh, priced. Um, yeah, so that's where they can you know effectively find out more. Mm-hmm. I've, I'm I'm always just posting up little things on my on my social media. So if people could follow, you know that would be um, fantastic. I don't know if you could put inshallah. a link in the bottom of the. We'll put the links below, inshallah. Yeah. we'll put the links below. Exactly. I appreciate that. Okay, so um, with regards to Mesur mm-hmm. and little Mesur, sure. Uh, there 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 are um. Kind of different institutes that kind of focus mm. on different elements. So, sure. for example, I know a brother who um, who 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 runs this madrasa, and kind of their focus is on. Um, oh, I think my volume is a bit too high there. Actually, I didn't realize that I did that. Mm. I don't know how long that was there for. Um, their focus is on the 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 design of the book, and and um, they they have like different kind of uh, ethos with kind of 
different departments that they have and stuff. My point in asking, in my point in the question is, what are your guys' kind of like key, um, your your key ethos that you try and stick to and refer back to? Sure, sure, definitely. I mean, I kind of uh, alluded to it a little while ago at the beginning. Um, and in a nutshell, what drives me, and inshallah ta'ala drives the team, is that we want to create those lifelong memories that our children will hold on to forever once they get to our age. And those lifelong memories that they hold on to are going to be memories of positivity, you know, um, fun, enjoyment, right? I would be devastated, you know, if I was in this position I'm in right now and any child that came across Meso, whether it's online or whether it's on you know, a physical location, had negative or bad emotions connected to that experience. You with me? You know, on the back of that, we obviously teach Arabic, we teach um, Quran, and we teach Islamic studies. They're like the, the main subjects that we want our kids to, to learn, as Muslim parents, right? Um, and oftentimes, other madrasas they would probably either only teach Quran or you might find the odd madrasa that might put a little bit of Arabic in and that, that is only going to be like Alif Bata you know they're not going to really teach you how to speak Arabic how to understand Arabic or maybe even how to write some may do I don't want to you know um, like make a blanket statement like that um, some may not even teach Islamic studies so that was one of the for lack of a better expression, USPs of Little Meso, all right? We don't want to just teach Qur'an, not saying that Qur'an isn't important, but we want to give a package. We want to give a package to the kids. So in doing that, we decided, khalas, as part of our curriculum, we're going to be doing Arabic, Qur'an, and Islamic studies. Alhamdulillah, I've got the Arabic from Medina. I've also benefited from my time from uh, the faculty, the kulia that I went to. So we've got the Islamic studies section covered. And generally speaking, what faculty is it that you graduated in? I graduated. Yeah, I graduated from the faculty of Al Hadith. Okay. Faculty of Al Hadith, and um, we just had, we just had uh, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble on a podcast yesterday, yeah. who uh, also graduated from Hadith. Gosh, about probably about. Uh, I want to be nice to him and not offend him, but I think just under twenty years ago now. Yeah, so, he. You know. I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Akhuna. I when he was nineteen, I believe. Mashallah, if I'm not mistaken, he had a, a blog spot up, if I'm not mistaken, actually, um, called uh, So You Want to Be a Student, or something like that. So when I actually got accepted to study in the Islamic University of Medina, now I'm going back way before it's, it, it may so now, when I wanted to study, because my, my journey started way before that. We actually probably should have touched upon that first, but we are where we are now. When I was trying to find out what the process is to go, because I got accepted, that's a story in and of itself, I got accepted, and I'm like, well, what do I do? You know, there, there wasn't much information out at that time, but he, mashallah, tabarakallah, he was instrumental in helping a lot of the British students know what to do in order to get over there. He pro I think it was him that meet, met, met, met us at the airport. He took us from the Subhanallah. airport. Subhanallah. Yeah, he. I mean, we haven't been in contact. We was after that. It was, it was like a service that he was providing for the students. It wasn't just like solely for, for me, Ismail. So it wasn't like we never organically became like good, good friends and we were rolling together, you know, on a daily basis. But um, I've got a lot of respect for him. And, you know, inshallah ta'ala, the impact that he has on the Dawah scene right now is a sign, bi'idhani lahi ta'ala, of his sincerity and the fact that inshallah ta'ala, Allah accepted his talab, wallahu a'lam, you know, um... So yeah, I'm I'm very familiar with the brother. I didn't know that he graduated I'm from Al Hadith I'm, though. Uh yeah 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 yeah. Hundred percent. I'm 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 ninety nine point nine percent. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean. I, I thought it was ninety nine point nine. I thought it was no, 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 I'm, no, 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 no. Um, I mean, I'll be very. I'm, I'm sure now. Now that like you're questioning it, it's making me question, <laughs> but, no, I'm 99. I, I literally think I, I confirmed it with him again, like okay. two months ago. So I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, Let you know what I do? I'll, I'll make sure. I'll make sure that this episode gets to him. Inshallah, I'll remind him. Yeah. I'll remind him. Inshallah. I mean, I, I didn't say that just so it gets to him. By the way, I don't want him. To, you know, no, 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 no. But but yeah. but it's a beautiful story that that he picked you up, and yeah. I I think he. You know what? Um, he he would he, he would make his day. It would make his day, I think. So, no, inshallah, I'll, 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 I'll try my best to make sure he gets to him uh, and his team. Bit um, so, bro, as I was saying, though, with the story. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you know what? This is the there's, nature of the podcast, I think. Yeah, actually, it's, there's so much to say. Even my, myself, yeah. think, everything's like this in my head right now. 
you know. So I, 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 no, no, no. I, I, let's round up the discussion on Mace Order. Yeah, let's 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 yeah, let's stick to that. So um, remind me actually what the question was again. So I said about the ethos, and you were mentioning that it's That's important it. to you. That's yeah, it. Go ahead. That's it. So we do Arabic, Islamic studies, and Quran. Got those subjects covered. Um, but another subject that I said to my wife, look, we have to. It's like imperative that we also teach this as a either as a separate subject. That was the initial idea, but the reality of it, the actual application of it, started to come a, 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 a bit difficult to teach as a separate subject, and that is growth mindset. Right, that is growth mindset. Um, so instead of teaching it as a separate subject after we after our first term, we said, look, let's just stick to those core subjects that I, I mentioned, but we have to incorporate growth mindset in what we're teaching. Sure. Whether you're doing Arabic, you've got an opportunity to show the importance of growth mindset and the detrimental effect of a negative mindset, then you mention it there. If you're doing Islamic studies, where wherever you can, if you're in the playground. That's what we're all about. Um, and the reason why I found it to be so important is because of the following reasons. Number one, as a 35 year old man now, right? I now understand the importance of having a positive mindset, a growth mindset. I know the importance of being around positive people, uh, staying away from negative people. I know the importance of having you know, positive affirmations and believing you know, that inshallah ta'ala good things are gonna happen because, and it's got an intrinsic link with our deen. You know, there's a famous hadith where um, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said that Allah is as his servant thinks of him. So if you're a person that goes around thinking negative all the time, you're just going to perceive everything in a negative way. I don't want to live like that. And I don't want people around me that think like that because now I'm going to fall, I, I potentially fall victim to that mindset. So I said, look, I don't want my kids, primarily my own kids, but by extension, my kids at the LMA Academy and I call them my kids because I love them like my own kids. I want my kids growing up and the light bulb switching on when they're 35. So what from five or six, however old they are now up until 35, 30 years wasted, 25 years wasted. Why? No, I want to, you know, be a force for change and teach them from now. Because I had to learn it the hard way. And that's no disrespect to my parents. My mashallah, tabarakallah, my mum and my father have been instrumental, akhi, in causing me to be who I am. The person that you see speaking in front of you today, akhi, a large portion of after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I thank my parents. Yeah, they gave me all of the, the skills and the mindset that I need. But nobody's perfect. You know, they did their best. There were certain things now that I think... If I knew that then, and I had like twenty years, I was I've been doing it for twenty years. I'll be a different. It'll be a, I'll be a different beast in in that regard, and that's what I want for our kids. You know, so um, growth mindset is something that we highly, highly, um, highly push. Um, we want the kids to believe in themselves and be proud of who they are, be proud of their identity. Because you probably know, just as I became a Muslim at uh, nineteen, so I went. I didn't have to battle. Right, um, hiding my Islam from anybody because of the, the social pressures of whether it's music or girls or clubs or smoking drugs. I don't have to worry about that because I was a non-Muslim. Whatever I did as a non-Muslim was just the normal. I wasn't trying to, if anything, I just hide from my parents. But I never had an identity crisis like, right, I'm, trying, I'm supposed to be a Muslim, but I'm doing this. I don't know how that feels. <clears throat> I don't know how that feels. I know how it feels on a, a smaller level being a Muslim now and still having my own trials that I, I go through on a daily basis, but not on that scale, because I can imagine it's difficult. I can imagine the 16, 17 year old Muslim growing up now, knowing that what he should do, but that pull is so strong. You know, I commend the brothers that are, you know, holding on to their, their, their religion. But needless to say, Akhi, needless to say, um, that's what we, we try to encourage the kids to, to do, to, to be positive, have a, a positive mindset, to believe in themselves. How do you do that? By, 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 by educating them and letting them know that by educating yourself, education doesn't have to be something that's boring and monotonous. Hence, you know, why I try to make my classes as interactive as possible. Since COVID-19 has come and just gripped the world by the throat, Akhi, we've had no choice but to move our um, activities online. So you can imagine, Akhi, in a classroom, I can raise my voice, I can, you know, click my finger sometimes, I can clap if I want to get a child's attention, I can um, crack a joke, 
you know, I can I can monitor how much people or, uh, you know, for the most part, how much the children are uh, paying attention. But when you're teaching online, a lot of that interactive uh, interactivity, just being there in person is taken away. Now you've got to pull out all the guns, all of your secrets, right, to keep the children engaged. And um, what well, Allah, alhamdulillah, shukr, whilst we have noticed a decrease in the amount of students that are attending our live classes, because online learning isn't for everybody, um, we, we still try to the best of our ability to make it as interactive as possible. So that's one way, you know, um, be proud of who you are by learning, by learning about your religion. And don't link learning about your religion to being something that's boring, something that you don't want to do. No, it can be very, very, very fun. Just to digress, if you don't mind, please. Um, no problem. I told you before we done our, our, our conversation today, I had a class, right? And that class yeah. was for, um, I call them five plus, so from five to seven from my academy. So I started off the class, it was an Islamic studies class. I started off the class by recapping the six pillars of Al-Iman. So what I did, um, I'm into animations, you know, I get I have crazy ideas just pop up. Like, yeah, my household's crazy right now, actually. What you see in the back looks, looks neat and tidy, but what you don't see yeah. <laughs> is what's on the floor and what's up on my walls, right? Wow. Anyway, so we've got this new uh, animation coming out. It's called uh, The Six Pillars of Iman Go-Kart Race. So I, I'm just trying to, you know, how can I teach these important aspects of our religion in a way that kids are going to enjoy? And obviously there's limitations. I can't, I can't do music. Um, I, I stay away from doing eyes, hence why I've just got a line to represent where an eye would go. And um, I try to be really sensitive to those things which Islam you know, encourages us at the most part, you know, uh, to be, or at the very least, shall I say, to be sensitive about. So um, I literally gave them the slides. So if you can imagine, just like how I can see you on my screen, I had, they could, I was sharing my screen. And I went through the six pillars of Iman, but in the form of a really funny race between my, my daughter and my son. And my daughter gets in front of my son and she puts oil on the floor, makes him scared. Crash goes down a dead end, uh, but he actually uh, uncovers a secret uh, shortcut. Um, he gets the third <laughs> pillar. And it's, it was a crazy story. And um, from what I could see, because they got their cameras on, they seemed they were, they were engaged, right? This is the memories that I want to leave for the kids, Zahi. When they were memorizing the six pillars, they remember, oh yeah, there was a fun story about a go-kart and oil and this, and then the, then the girl crashed into the boy, but they were both winners in the end because they both tried. The, that's the kind of, you know, if I said to you, Achi, growing up, give me like, the top three cartoons that you remember. What would you say? Achi, you know what? I was a weird kid. I hated cartoons. What? Serious? Uh, wow. Maybe like when I was really young, Tom and Jerry. Yeah, okay. I never even liked that, cartoons, Achi. I mean, I, uh, if you say some of the most famous cartoons that even if they weren't a part of your childhood, you still know them. you got Tom and Jerry. You've mm. probably got um, Bart Simpson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, depending on your era, South Park. That I missed that era. I wasn't yeah. into all of that stuff. You know, but mm. these are these are these are like iconic moments in certain generations, right? It's my dream to make Little May Saw and animations that we produce iconic for the this our, our kid. You got a child, I believe, right, little girl. A uh, little boy. Little I'm boy. Sorry, I do apologize, Zachy. Um, no I want these cartoons to be iconic for him. I want him to grow up. So when he's 15, 16, saying, yeah, like when I was a kid, I used to watch Little Maisel cartoons, wow. you know? So that's how we try to link in the, the self-belief, the, the, uh, the, all, all of the subjects that we do have um, an Islamic connotation, or at the very least, we're going to be encouraging, you know, positive mindset, which if you think about it, actually, if you're honest, it is a, an Islamic, it, is, it has got its links in Islam to be positive and not Definitely. to be negative and not to give up hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stuff like that. Um, you know, I mentioned that we try to make, uh, you know, uh, our stuff interactive and stuff like that. And another thing I feel ultra passionate about, Akhi, we haven't got the nail on it. We haven't hit the nail on the head yet, but we offer opportunities for everybody. And what do I mean by that? Um, many children in the Muslim community have um, SEN. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with that term. It's re it refers to uh, special educational needs. Okay. Special educational needs. Uh, a lot of my followers that, you know, on my platform uh, will know that my second daughter, Ruqayya, she was actually born with Down syndrome. Again, okay. that's another story, how I found out, how we dealt with it, because it was a challenge at the time. Remember, I'm 35. My girl is 10 or 11 years old. Wait, she's 10, I think. I had her like around, um, wait, let me think. No, I'm 35. She's 10. I would have been 25. Yeah, that's it. I was about 24, I was about 23, 24, 
when I had my daughter. So I was young. The odds were all stacked against us to have a child that has Down syndrome at that. Because they usually say that, you know, parents who are in the later stages of their life, 40 perhaps and above, I was 25. Or they say, Wallahu A'lam, this is what they say, that, you know, uh, when you ha um, when you marry close family relatives, Sahih, sir. it can happen. Me and my wife are from two different parts of the planet, uh, the world, you know. So everything was stacked against that. I, I don't have no Down syndrome children in my family that I know of. You know, my immediate family, cousins and aunties and whatnot. And neither does my wife. So everything was stacked against us. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with a child and that child so happened to have Down syndrome, I didn't see it as uh, how some people may see it, a negative thing. You with me? I just saw it. This was what Allah's given me. Now I have to deal with it. Do you see what I'm saying? I have to deal with it. I have to pull up my socks and deal with it. At the end of the day, you know, whether your child's got Down syndrome or autism or whatever the um, challenge is, that doesn't take away from how much you're going to love the child. You don't say, okay, if my child has SEM, I love them 80%. And if they don't, I love them 100%. Or if my child has SEM, I love them 100%. And if they, if they don't have any, you know, special educational needs, I'll love them a little. You love your child regardless of the situation. You know, it's almost unconditional. So, um, because I, I was somebody that has experienced that, it's now made me more sympathetic to other parents. And I would be, you know, it would make my skin crawl to know that, let's say, for example, I didn't have an SEN child. So I wasn't even thinking about how parents cope who have SEN children I would hate to have you know develop little may saw and because they can be challenging to deal with sometimes or they may need some uh, extra care and attention inside the classroom just be like no sorry we don't accept uh, children with special needs that breaks my heart you with me because mm -hmm. I wouldn't like it done to me you know so we accept everybody and we have had children who have had some, you know, different levels of um, SEN. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it hasn't always worked out um, because we don't have the resources and the, the skills. You know, it's a skill to teach. Because I'm a parent of an SEN child, doesn't necessarily mean I've got the skills to teach one. I pick up things along the way. I've got experience. But, you know, when you've got a class of, say, 15, 16, 17 kids, um, and the child is, for example, um, is quite hyperactive. He bounces a lot or he shouts and blurts things out. It does in some way affect the learning of other children. But at the end of the day, we're a family. We're a family. You know, I'm not, I don't, I would hate somebody to discriminate against me. So we believe uh, fully in not discriminating against any child. So we do accept children with special needs or special educational needs. But we do want to make sure it's crystal clear that we don't have the facilities to deal with them. We're not perfect in that regard, but we still do try. And I think that's, right. that, that, that should go a long way, you know. I ask Allah put barakah in uh, Maysour and little Maysour uh, Arabic. I think it's an amazing initiative, and uh, I think your ethos and, and and what you guys stand for mm. is Allahu uh, Akbar. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, earlier I told you that kind of how I came across you was um, I I saw you on Instagram, right? Mm. And when I saw you on Instagram, mm. um, eventually when I scrolled down, I saw a clip or like a. Um, a thumbnail that took me uh, by surprise. Mm. It was yourself. Mm. Uh, uh, I think you, I, I think I saw this on, you, on your Instagram when you were in the hospital bed, and Subhanallah, you were looking very, 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 very skinny. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I clicked on it, mm. and I ended up finding out about your story. I found out about the fact that you had, and I know very little about mm. uh, the story. And I, I mentioned in the intro that I'm probably going to learn yeah. along with the viewers today about your story. Yeah. But from what I know, from what I know was that you had been diagnosed with cancer, That's true. and that um, I want to say that I saw. Uh, I think it was yourself that I saw this video of, of you explaining what it was like. It was a maybe a maybe a caption explaining what it was like having to tell your uh, family. Mm. Was that your? Was that was that something that I read on your? Yeah, Instagram? yeah, I believe yeah. It was. Yeah, I've, I've, okay, I've, I've definitely shared something along those lines. <coughs> so, um, so, so, what, what, what year was what year was this when when this when this was happening? Had you had you finished your studies in Medina at the time? When I got diagnosed. 
Yes. Yeah, I got diagnosed on the 25th of August, um, 2018, five days after my, um, my birthday. Uh, I graduated in 2017. Okay. So just to um just to kind of put things in context, you mentioned uh, the picture that you saw where I'd, I'd lost a lot of weight and I'd lost uh, nearly half my weight, half my weight. Okay. When I was in Medina towards the, the latter, you know, time, uh, the period of the, the time that I spent there, I was, you know, fully in the gym. I've seen a few of your, because uh, I've, I've browsed your page as well. I've seen you doing your deadlifts and all of that. I, I used to be into all of that, all of that and then some, you know, like proper um, I love the whole keeping fit and, you know, being athletic and stuff like that. So I came back from Medina, 83 kg. On my personal Instagram, I saw a picture I took off when I weighed myself. But just like a couple months before I left Medina, I was in one of them, 83. And then another one, if I'm not mistaken, 82 kg. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, and I was going to... Are, are we talking, are we talking, are we talking 83 kg of muscle? Uh, I would like to think so. I would like to think. <laughs> yeah. I would like to think. That's so, strong, Aki. Eighty three is a big number. And I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not tall, Aki. I'm. 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 I'm a, I'm a little bit. You know. I'm a little bit. I'm five foot nothing. You know. So um. Alhamd. You know. That's what I was into. I was training with a Russian brother. You know. May Allah bless him. Just before I left. Wait, are you saying you, you you're, you're five foot? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, Aki, I, I was getting worried. Five foot at eighty three. No, 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 no. You're five foot something. Yeah, yeah. But I just said five foot nothing, meaning that I'm five foot six or five. No, I'm about five foot. I'm about five foot eight. On a, on a good, same as me. Same as me. On, on a good day. Sack, with shoes day. on. Yeah, and with shoes with, on. With yeah. the right, with the right shoes on. That's it. That's <laughs> it. And got the Harachis. That's it. You see, like, Shaq, for for, for Shaq. short brothers like ourselves, when you've got a lot of weight, you just look round. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah okay. no. I'm on. I'm on about that now. I'm about eighty three now. Okay, so, uh, I don't uh, mean you no. Feel it a bit. You feel I, it a bit. I, I didn't mean no, no, no disrespect. Don't worry. <laughs> I didn't mean no disrespect. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, well, I'm really resonating with you on this one, actually, because everyone's they, beautiful. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Everyone's uh, beautiful, man. <laughs> but I mean, that, that that's where I was, right? So I came back fine, from Medina, fine. and um, you know, I was I, I felt healthy. You know, I yeah, I, 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 right. I don't smoke. I don't drink. Um, I was going to the gym, swimming, and stuff like that. I was training with a Russian brother. So like, I, I didn't even think about my health, you know, not at all. Um, I came back and uh, one of the struggles that I had, and I know some other brothers at least, that, you know, uh, that graduate have is that we come, we spent like, I spent eight years over there, seven, eight years over there. And then you come back and then there's nothing. You know, you might come back, you might, I went over there with two children. I came back with four. Do you know what I mean? I went over there with two children. I came back with four. One of my boy, one of my children was actually born in Al Medina. Wow. So then, yes. Yeah, how so many do you have? How many do you have now? I've, I've, no, I've got five now. I, I, I tell you about that one. Uh, of well. course, recently you had a child, that, that's right? That's it, and that's post cancer. Okay. My last okay. boy, Ishaq. Huh? Ishaq. He, yeah, Ishaq, man. He's like literally a mini me. He's a mini me. One of my 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 wife's friends saw him. Uh, old uni friend, um, non-Muslim girl, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up her heart to Al-Islam and th she was asked, you know, who does he look like? She's like, you made him by yourself. As if, like, <laughs> that's, I, he, he looks like me completely. And it's lovely actually because... How old is Ishaq? Ishaq now is about, say, two months. Okay. Two months old, you know, and I've always asked Allah, say, oh, yeah, you know, one of those secret du'as that you don't even tell your missus. Give, mm. give me a boy that just looks like me. Not because I'm vain or anything like that. I just want to... All my kids are going to continue the legacy in the name, you know. But I just so, I just wanted a child that just looked like me. Do you know what I mean? So, my, know? Son, my son, Zakaria, he's... Uh, Mashallah. He's five five months. Mashallah. And, Allahumma uh, barifi. And, uh, akhi, spitting image of my wife and her family. That's the... Spitting image, akhi. That's the... And I remember, like... But alhamdulillah, akhi, I'm happy. Like, if I... If it was up to me and my child either looks like me or my missus, I yeah. prefer that he looks like my missus, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh... And he... And, uh, but, but, but it's funny because my in-laws are always uh, commenting, saying, like... Uh, Oh, uh, he looks like you know our side of the family. They yeah. look at me and they're like, no, 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 no. He does. He does look a bit like. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, like they, they think that sure. I feel bad. I'm like, I'm alright. No, 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 that's beautiful. Ma'am, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless your son, Zakaria. I've also got a son called Zakaria. Oh, Allah Yeah, yeah. Make him be the um, the apple of your both of your 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 eyes, inshallah ta'ala. Um, remind me. What did we? So we started speaking about. Oh yeah. So I came back from Medina. That's it. So I came back from Medina, and a lot of things that students struggle with is that they they don't have nothing to do. There's there's no way to make no money. 
you know, if they're asked to give a lesson, it's like a fisa bilillah, you know. If they're um if they want to charge, they're they're vilified and they're looked down upon. Mm-hmm. How can you charge given Islamic knowledge and stuff like that? And it's just like whatever kind of thing. So what happens? And I was this close, I kid you not, my brother. Like face it, this close to packing it in. Whilst I was in Medina, I was this close to packing it in. When I came back, I was this close to saying, you know what? I got a family to provide. That's my concern. Trying to quote unquote save people, that's not my concern. I've been there. I've been in those dark uh, moments. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a different plan for me. But, um, you know, I came back and I started, and I've never shared, sh- shared what I'm about to say right now, Akhi, I have never shared this with, I don't think more than five people know, uh, I'm not talking about family, outside of family. I'm talking about close friends won't even know what I'm about to share right now. I came back from Al Medina, Akhi, and I'm like, I need to find a job, right? Um, I was offered some, uh, an, an, an imam position in a particular masjid, which later on I subsequently accepted. And I'll tell you why I accepted it, but um, why, I, why I turned it down the first time, even when I was in Medina, just as I was going to graduate, brother was like, Akhi, do you want to be, be the imam? And I'm like, nope, because, and this is a problem about mindset, and this is why I feel so passionate about it. As a graduate of Al Medina, or somebody that was just about to graduate, I didn't see myself worthy of even speaking. You know why? Because the narrative that we were given over in Al Medina is, you can't speak. You can't, you, like, it's, it's not for, uh, you know, like, go back to scholars, go back to, scholars, go back to scholars, which is true. But at the same time, if somebody spent eight years of their life studying something, then why can't they help their community? You know, so. we should be going over there, you know, inshallah ta'ala, first and foremost with the intention to remove the ignorance from our own selves so we can save ourselves. And as you mentioned from the verse earlier on today and our families, and then by extension, trying to spread that khair to other people. But because of my negative mindset, I'm like, no, nah, people won't want to hear what I'm going to say. Or I was around such a toxic environment for the vast majority of my time in Medina. You know, situations that have scarred me to this day, you know, and, and has have broken relationships with people that probably, wallahu a'lam, will never ever mend. I came back thinking that oh, people are going to be trying to catch me out. I say something wrong, that's it, khalas, they're going to take this, run back to the sheikh. Get the sheikh to, to refute me and I'm finished. I went through that when I was in Medina and I was like, no, nah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not giving nobody the satisfaction. It was over a period of time and speaking to people that I, I love and I respect, such as Tahir White. He's a friend of mine. He's a brother of mine. And I, he was, he's, he's somebody that I would consider to be a sheikh of mine. Mufti Munir. He was, again, somebody who... Um, um, not so much like Tahir to me in terms of like a mental relationship, re- re- relationship but I, I looked up to him tremendously, you know, spent some time with him in Medina. It was being around brothers like this that enabled me to break the shackles. And when I say break the shackles, break the shackles of being um, confined and concerned about what people are going to say about me. Because when I went through what I went through in Medina, and inshallah ta'ala, hopefully we can get together in another podcast, we can go through that if it's, if it's going to bring about some benefit. They done everything to me. In my head at the time, I said, the only thing left for you to do, guys, is to kill me. You've already physically assaulted me. You've already stopped loads of people from speaking to me. You've already caused me great pain in my own personal life. You've already disrupted my relationship with Allah because now I can't can't pray properly because every time I go to pray, I'm thinking about what's going to happen. You've already affected my, my, my talab, me seeking knowledge. Do you know what I mean? Uh, when I came back to England, sorry, when I was still in Medina, you already affect because I was still I was selling courses for like fifty pounds. So I was like, like a whole book one for like fifty pounds cheap. Um, people were people were uh, pulling out. <laughs> people were pulling out. Actually, there was one sister in particular that was like, you know, Allah al Musta'an. After you know hearing what I've been hearing about you, I, I, I want to get a refund. And I'm like, wow, look how strong a narrative is when it's coming from a certain. Uh, individual or set of individuals people don't even know or even care what the truth is because there's always i say three sides to a story there's his side there's my side and there's the truth i'm going to say what i say based upon my perception and i have to acknowledge as a, as a, as a man i could be wrong i could have done some wrong in certain events that have transpired and you guys also may have done wrong all right but the truth is the truth so um 
I, th I didn't feel I was qualified to be an imam and as a result, I ended up getting a job in Waitrose. <laughs> and I don't say that in a derogatory way because some people work in Waitrose and they, they work in uh, jobs like this to feed their family. And if that's what you're doing, then it's an honorable, honorable thing to do. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless those people. But what I was struggling with specifically, Akhi, was I've just spent seven, eight years in Medina. I already had a degree before I went to Medina, Akhi. I had a degree in, uh, from LCC in Elephant and Castle, right? Subsequently, where I met my wife from the London College of Communication in um, uh, BA in uh, Digital Media Production. I then went after that to go and get a CELTA. Um, I went then after that to go and get a diploma in Arabic language, two years. Then I went to get my BA in Al Hadith. So I was like, I was overqualified for that, <clears throat> for that job. That's what I'm saying. So I'll be stacking shelves and it was the midnight shift. It was like from 11 at night to six in the morning. That's where I was, Echi. So I'm stacking shelves and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I laughed to myself, I was like, last week I was literally with Tahir in Medina. Or I was, with the, I was in this Sheikh's lesson. Now I'm stacking shelves. Can you just imagine the, the psychological um, like battle that was going on inside? I'm in an environment where they're playing music and they were playing music like it was like that the midnight shift so they was playing i'm an 80s baby 84 actually 1984 that's the year i was born the best year to be to be born and allah knows best right they would they would play old school classics you know that i used to listen to when i was um before islam so can you just imagine that the the, the internal battle you know um and naturally i was stressed we didn't have a place. Me and my wife never had a place. So when we came back from Medina, and I'm just being really, really open and transparent with you, Akhi. When I came back from Medina, we never had a place to live in. We were living out of suitcases. So we would go to my parents' house in the weekend, me and my four kids at that time, because I only had four at that time. Allahu Akbar. And then during the week, either we would all go back to my in-laws, right? Um, which is about a half an hour, 45 minute drive, depending on traffic. Or sometimes my wife would just go and I would stay where I was. Because where I was staying was closer to where I was working. It was 10 minutes away. You know? So it, was, it wasn't it was an ideal situation, an ideal way to, to live your life. And then, you know, as a man, you start to say like, did I do the right thing? I've, I'm, like, going to Medina was my dream. It wasn't my wife's dream. It was my dream. You with me? As a supporting, loving, caring wife, she followed not all brothers' wives want to want to make that. It's, it's, it can be challenging, lonely when you're over there. She she followed my dream. At the time, I'm like, what have I got to show for it? I'm living between houses. We don't even have um, a bed that can. So everyone, the kids don't have their own bed. There's like six to a bed. You know, waking up with a toe in your nose here and a knee in your back there. That was the norm. But I always had a feeling that inshallah it's gonna change one day. You with me? And that's that hope, my brother, is what I clung on to. And that hope is what I cling on to now with my, my journey with cancer. The moment you take away hope from somebody, that's it, it's finished. You with me? If you're facing, like, you know, may Allah protect you, but if a person's facing a life-threatening disease, don't take away their hope. Because you take away their hope, you take away everything. My, my, my health is slowly degrading away as from a medical perspective. That's what they tell me when I go for scans. I don't think you like looking at me now with necessarily say that I look sick I don't sound sick I'm not acting like I'm sick but inside something I can't control there's, there's things going on that's beyond my control don't take away uh, that hope so anyway we're working I'm working away and as a result of being stressed and the, 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 the situation I'm under not making too much money um, I naturally just started to lose weight you with me so I'm not eating like I was I'm not going gym like I was I actually started playing racquetball with my father on my personal Instagram, you'll see some, um, you know what racquetball is, Akhi? It's like squash, but it's a bigger, bit, the racket's a bit different and the balls are a bit, bit bigger as well. Fine, okay. So okay. I started playing that. So I started to slim down, Akhi. I went down from like what I was, 82, 83, 75, 74, 70, 69. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of liking this, this new lean look because naturally that's how I was before I... I went to Saudi, you know, I was I've always been a slim build. But, 
you know, Echi, there's no love like your mother's love. There is absolutely no love like your mother's love. And I alluded to this on the very first video I put out, right? After I got diagnosed with cancer, which subsequently went viral. Never had a video that has 80,000 views before. That video went viral. Um, and I mentioned, that, that, you know, how, I, how it came about. And it was basically, I started losing weight. I put it down to stress. My mum was like, you need to go get a blood test. And I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, man. I'm all right, man. I'm just a bit, you know, just stressed out and whatnot. And plus, I'm, I'm exercising. She goes, no, your face is looking gaunt, meaning, you know, you know when it looks like skeletonish. You know, like you, you can see the bones and stuff. Yeah, you see the, I'm starting to see this, you know. And I'm, I'm naturally a worrier. I worry about a lot of things. So, okay, that's like me. Yeah. I don't like putting myself in a situation. My wife gets annoyed at me. She's like, you're just such a worrier. I, and it's like, it's annoying because I don't want to, you know, well, maybe I should. I don't know. Maybe I should take some blame. But as a result of being a worrier, it prevented me from getting help earlier. Who knows, right? Who knows what I could have prevented had I just not been that way, right? And got help earlier. But now it's too late for shoulda, coulda, wouldas. But what I can do is I can share my story with people, you know, so they don't make the same mistakes uh, that I made. In any case, for, for I'm, actually, I'm talking about for months, I put it off. I used to fall asleep. My dad reminded me of this the other day. I remember, but he reminded me. I would come home, remember, I'm living with my parents as a 33-year-old man, uh, which, again, I was struggling with as well. But there's no, there's no shame in that. Some families do that. Some cultures do that. And it's good. But it was difficult for me to deal with because it's not as if we were all living with my parents. It's like my wife's with her in-laws. I'm battling with, have I let my father-in-law down? Like, he gave me his daughter. That's, that's, that's tremendous. And now what have I got to show? Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him. He has never, ever made me feel any less of a man. And that's, again, that's a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me in a sense that he's allowed me to be connected to a family like that. Walillah, alhamdulillah, shukr. So anyway, I'm losing weight. Eventually, she told me to go get a blood test. So I did. Went, got the blood test, and I think I did a stool sample. And then um, she's like, oh... Have you, like, after a couple, like, two weeks, have you called them? Have you called them? I'm like, no, mom, like, if there's a problem, they're going to call me, right? I don't want to call up to search for, <laughs> for remember before yeah. I said you have to search for the good in, in the evil. Yeah. I don't want to search for no evil when things seem to be going good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I didn't say nothing. And then um, eventually they called me and I was like, hi, Mr. Beaumont. That's my name, Chris Beaumont. Uh, my birth name, sorry. Um, yeah, your results came back and everything's clear. So I'm like, kind of thing you know so I crack on I start to lose more weight and I don't notice it because it's happening to me to you, right. you know huh. and I'm again because of those external factors that I mentioned about being stressed out and whatnot I just put it down to the stress and I was obviously exercising I was, I was actually going quite hard actually um in the gym um and my mom said no you need to go for a second opinion and that took a long time for me for her to persuade me to do it again until one time she said, she said, you're going to kill me. You with me? And, and to hear your mum say that, that was, that was hard. So I'm like, all right, mum, all right, I'll go. So I went again for another stool, uh, stool sample and a blood test. But this time, I, I believe he was, um, the, the, my GP, this time, he, he didn't run exactly the same test, Achi. He was looking for something that he wasn't looking for the first time. Um, but obviously I didn't know. I just thought I was just repeating the, 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 the test. And um, some time went, I hear nothing. So again, me being a worry, I'm thinking, Khalas, no news is good news, as they say. No news is good news. So um, one day, I, I remember this like it was yesterday. I was sleeping. I was fast asleep. It must have been about nine o'clock or whatever. My mum comes in the uh, the room and said, Oh, the GP just called because they called her mobile. The GP just called uh, and they want to speak to you. So I'm panic inside. I'm pan I've just woken up, number one. I'm disorientated to my mum saying, call them back, call them back, call them back. So now I'm getting scared. So I say to my mum, like, oh, what did they say? She's like, I, I don't know. They wouldn't speak to me because, you know, for confidentiality reasons, they can only speak to the person. So then I'm getting, I'm getting upset thinking, well, like, why, why, if, if nothing was wrong... Why won't they just say, oh, just let him know everything's fine. So I'm panicking inside. And what's happening, Nahi, not intentionally, but the panic that's happening inside 
it's causing me to act a certain way. I, I don't want to act like this, but I'm scared and I'm nervous. You with me? So I call up the um, I call up the uh, the GP surgery and the assistant answers. The secretary answers the phone. I nearly get into an argument with her because I'm so scared. Yeah, you're panicking. I'm yeah. panicking. I'm like, you know, you just called my mum. She's like, yeah. I said, well, why, why didn't you tell her what's up? Why, if, if nothing's the matter, why didn't you say that? So I'm getting into an argument and she's only just trying to do her job. But it's because I was, I didn't know how to, um, I didn't know how to handle the emotion. You with me? And I think this is what happens to a lot of us when we act a certain way and we say things. It's because we feel, ha we have these emotions, but we just don't know how to, to deal with them because they don't feel nice. You with me? They don't feel, it feels uncomfortable. And as a result, we, end, we tend to say things that we end up regretting or do things that subsequently we end up regretting. Anyway, um, I got through to the GP and he says that you have to come in. We want to speak to you. So I was like, OK, cool. Come in. Um, that was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on my birthday, 20th of August, right, 2018. So I went in. Um, and then he told me that they've seen something in my, uh, my my blood or they've seen something in the results and they want me to take, I take a colonoscopy. So I was me and my wife here, just me and my wife in the surgery. And I said, a colonoscopy, what? I've never heard of that word before. And she, he's like, this is, this is what he did to me. This was the first point, if you like, in the trauma that I subsequently went through, right? He went, you done like this. He went, you have to put, we have to put a camera up. And he went like this with his finger. And I said to myself, I'm just a, just a normal, regular black boy from South East London. You understand? Like, like, I'm sure, you know, your, your demographic and where you grow up and, you know, around your friends, like anything that's connected to anything internal in that part of your body is a no-no. You with me? And I'm still holding on to those from my Jahiliya. Like, no, I said to him, no, let's, we need to talk about it. I'm like, no, we need to talk about this. I don't know how I feel about this. You know, I'm, like, I'm not having that done to me. That's not happening, man. And he's like, it could be potentially life or death. So now I'm just, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm hearing these, 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 these hard, harsh words. And I, I, again, I, I don't know how to deal with it. The next day, if I'm not mistaken, was Eid. Because I remember going um, to the Eid Park uh, in, in our locality. And there was loads of my wife's family there. And so my wife now knows that obviously I got to have a procedure, which is going to be five. I didn't know at the time, but it's going to be five days later on the 25th of August. But one of her aunties, she was like, oh, it's my, what's up, man? You, you, you lost so much weight. And it was just like, she said it just, just making a, a passing comment, you know, as you would do to somebody, but she didn't know what was happening. And I, I wasn't ready to tell anybody because I didn't know what the situation was. But come the 25th now, I had the procedure and I was absolutely terrified, Aki, terrified. Um, they, they gave me the procedure and they, I, I remember um, it wasn't as bad as I thought, by the way. So if anybody listening ever has to go through a colonoscopy, it's not as bad as you probably think it is. It's not the, you know, the most enjoyable thing in the world you know by no stretch of the imagination but um they, they the guy did what he had to do man and i remember sitting on the um laying sorry on the the, the operating table when he'd finished and then i'm still laying down on my left hand side like this actually, still laying down and i just looked at him and i said did you see anything i said doc did you see anything and then he said he just said um do you want me to tell you now what does that mean actually? do you see what i'm saying so it's like he told me without telling me, so I had I had chance I had a chance to brace myself. You with me? It wasn't like it in was your head at this point in your head when you're saying he told you about telling you in your head is it, are you thinking along the lines of cancer? Though? Yeah, I can't remember why okay. in saying that I I, I um I can't remember why I was I I linked it to cancer. I can't remember why I really can't remember why I linked it to cancer. But I think it's the it, it's it, it's like the it's like. In a lot of our heads, it's almost like a scenario that you jump to because it's the scenario that you you want the least almost. You know, you want them to yeah. come back and say it's maybe an infection or something. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, and natu naturally we think, oh, if if they say that, you almost... Am I right? Maybe, or maybe some... You know what I think happened beforehand, before the colonoscopy, if I'm not mistaken. 
and this one again was um, really tough for me, man. It's quite foggy in my head, Aki, but there was one time I had to have a consultation. No, I think that was after it. It was definitely after. It was definitely after. I'll, I'll get to that stage. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I can't remember, but either either, he said, do you want me to tell you now? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, yeah. And then he said, I found something. So I just kind of laid my head back down and it was the most surreal out of body experience ever. It was almost as if I was looking at myself. Like I felt numb, like me, nah, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm, I'm young, like, nah. And I didn't know at the time, but the, the type of cancer that I have, colon cancer, um, it's very, very rare for a young person to get it. It's now becoming more common nearly every single GP or doctor or medical professional that I've in whatever medical professional you are whether you're a nurse to a GP or a doctor or a surgeon they always say or an oncologist right they always say you're pretty young how old are you are you with me it's normally something that affects older people again I, don't, I just took I just took it for what it was I, I, you know I don't look into how young or old I am I've got it <laughs> I gotta deal with it I gotta find a solution do you know what I mean so um I was still, I didn't cry at first. I was just like, how I am now, just like kind of shocked. And then I was laying in the um, the, op the, the the waiting room, the recovery area, they call it. And uh, I was like, can I, can you let my, 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 my wife and my father was with me. Mm. My wife and my father was with me at the time, but obviously they were, um, they were waiting. Uh, bear with me one second, bro. No stress, no stress. You see the fact that um, I'm speaking about it now and I'm, I'm, I'm not able to uh, control myself. It, it, it proves that it's still, you know, a point of cont it's still a sore point. You get me? I'm not totally over it. I'm getting better. I'm actually surprised that I've gone this far, but I'm not. So we don't need to talk about anything that you're not comfortable to talk about. Though. Let's let let's keep going, actually. Let's keep we're here. You know we're here, and um, who knows, um, who knows who may listen to this and you know see it as a source of inspiration or it might maybe somebody else is going through. It, you know, um, I'm not the only one that's got cancer, actually. Do you know what I mean? Um, many people before me, many people since, <clears throat> many people that you know, will get cancer after my diagnosis. I think one of the reasons that kind of catapulted my journey into the limelight was because of my story. I was a student, you know, I was, then I became an imam and, and stuff like that, right? Um, I didn't mention this, I totally forgot, but in the interim period between working in Waitrose and I said, khalas, I can't deal with this no more, I then was offered again for the second time to become an imam. And I said, you know what? The, the money was low, but it's a trillion times better than what I'm doing right now. So then I took the position as the Imam. So all of that whole story contributed to why, and Allah knows best, why my diagnosis, you know, went out there as opposed to the average Muslim who gets cancer. Like I'm no more important than he is, or I'm no more important than she is. It's just a story. It's just a story and it is what it is kind of thing. So anyway, I, I, I waited, you know, they said, yeah, they're going to let my, my parent, my, 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 my wife and my father come down. So you can imagine from their point of view now, they're just like, they want to know the results. They want to know the results, right? So I was sitting down and they came in and, you know, they give you a little bit of um, anesthetic to, to when they do the procedure. So I was a little bit drowsy, but I was still with it. A little bit drowsy, I was still with it. Um, and then they came in, they're like, oh, you're right, everything all right? And the doctor was in at the same time, i.e. the guy that did the procedure. So he said to he said to um he said to me, Would you like me to tell them? I said, No. Because at the end of the day, right, patience, Achi, right, when you're afflicted with something, is when the calamity first hits. You don't have the concession to scream and wail and punch the wall and start acting out, swearing and acting all wild, and then after like couple hours and say you know what, i'm gonna be paid. that's not patience look patience is when a calamity first hits and you know i didn't know how my wife was gonna take it i didn't know how my dad was gonna take it so um 
I said to her, Habibati, listen. <coughs> I said words to the effect that I just told you, right? <coughs> I said, listen, patience is when the calamity first hits. So make sure that the words that come out your mouth after what I'm about to tell you is Alhamdulillah. So she, again, is, is almost like, it was almost like I was preparing her for some bad news. Because if I just said, our oh, babes, they found cancer. She would pro I don't, I didn't know she was going to scream. I didn't know how my dad was going to act. So that was kind of me telling her without me telling her. You with me? And then I said that they found something. And obviously, like, she was um, devastated and, and shocked and stuff like that. But again, it still didn't sink in. I don't think I cried. Or maybe I got a bit emotional when I said that part to her. You know, and then the guy was like, you know, it's okay. It's like, um, hopefully we caught it in the early stages. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot... He didn't start talking treatments, but he was saying that there's good... He was trying to reassure me, you know? Mm. He's saying there's, um, there's a lot of good treatments out there uh, at the moment uh, that you can uh, get, you know, the, the chemotherapy's improved since then. And I'm like, Chemo chemotherapy? I, uh, yeah, I'm not into what that. I'm not into... Alhamdulillah, to this day, I haven't taken a single uh, chemotherapy jab, although they wanted to, wow. they want to give it to me. Um, again, that's another, yeah, that's another story, like, for later on. So anyway, <clears throat> I came out of the hospital, and I came home, I went to my wife's house, because that's where I was living at the time, and that's where I did the video. I did it in her mum's front room, and that's the video that went viral, but I did it as a live, a Facebook live, um, and that's why it's, I put it up on YouTube later, but that's where the traction happened on, on the Facebook live. And um, <clears throat> you can imagine, actually, the next, like, couple of weeks was crazy. My phone was blowing up left, right and centre. And in a weird way, <laughs> in a weird way, as devastating as the news um, was and is, I had a lot of love. I had a lot of love from people and the love helped me deal with it. And I learned from that. And this is something that I want you guys to, you know, the, 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 the users, you saw not the users, the, I'm so used to talking about courses, I'm saying users and students, the, the listeners, I've got to change my vocab now. I want the listeners to take away from is Look, when, you, when you're faced with a situation, look for the takeaways. What can you take away from it? As opposed to looking at what you're potentially losing, all right? What I took away from that was, don't ever underestimate the importance of showing love to somebody. Because you don't know what a person's going through, right, in its entirety. You might know somebody's, for example, in my case, is being diagnosed. But the, the, the spiritual or the emotional or the, the mental ramifications of that are not always clear. You with me? But when you show, reach out, show love and support to somebody, that there can be a source of strength for that person that's suffering. So after a while, like I didn't even feel like I was going through anything because I had only been told I'd got it. I got a tumor, you know. And I was like, well, I don't feel anything per se. Mm -hmm. I I have trouble sometimes when I'm when I'm going to the toilet. Akramakumullah. Yeah, I need to you know to not number two specifically. And that's another sign that I had. On top of the extreme weight loss, uh, I experienced um, like blood in my stool. And then when I thought back long and hard, remember I'm back in the UK now when I got the diagnosis. I remember I was like, no, this has kind of been happening from Medina. So I had it when I was in Medina. Akhi. I just didn't know. And it didn't show its ugly signs because I was still quite big. You know, what it was doing, it was the, the tumour, if I'm not mistaken, was like seven or eight centimetres in my colon, which is just like where you are, the, the, up the anal area. But So it's not like at the tip, it's up a bit and like round. That's kind of where it was right there. But your colon is really, really long. I didn't know that. That's another thing I learned from this experience. I learned, I learned more about my anatomy, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I, felt, I felt fine. I felt fine. But what we did straight away, like literally the next day, I cut, I cut out all bad foods that I shouldn't be eating, that the majority of us shouldn't be eating. And that's another thing, Ikhwani, the, the ones that are listening. The takeaway that I want you to take away from this is don't be like me who was negligent as it relates to the food that I ate and the drinks that I consumed. It's not alcoholic beverages or anything like that, or anything haram, but fizzy drinks, you know, uh, drinks that contain a lot of sugar or um, added preservatives and food that's just not good for the human body. Don't wait till your, 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 your life's on the line now and you risk losing everything to say, you know what, let me make a change. Why? Because there's nothing, Ahi, that's worth being in a situation. Yes, there's been 
benefits that I've received as a result. But I wish I would have learned those lessons. I, I wish I didn't have to go through this, you know, and be in this position to learn those lessons. I wish I could have learned it from somebody just telling me. Do you know what I mean? So um, we changed the food that I, I was eating. So I stopped meat, chicken. I, I, I <clears throat> My diet consisted of rabbit food, literally, up until they were going to give me um, uh, the, my, my operation, all right? My operation, which was to cut a section of my colon out. So we're thinking that if we change our diet, who, who knows? Allahu a'ala, maybe the, the thing will just go. Do you know what I mean? Or they're going to see a, 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 a significant reduction in the, in the tumor. So I, I started um, uh, uh, changing my food. And as a result, I lost more weight. No protein or not enough protein going into my body now. You know, I lost a lot of weight. In the interim period, there was a very, very generous sister. I don't know if she would want me to mention her name on a public platform, so I won't. But she knows who she is. You know, everybody knows who contributed or saw the, uh, the GoFundMe page at the time. They will know who I'm speaking about. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her, her family immensely. Um, she... Amen. She... Um, said do you mind if i do a gofund got gofundme page for you and i appreciated the gesture because at the time my job was on the line my job was on the line actually because i can't work no more right although that situation rectified itself in the end uh, needless to say i was worried like what am i going to do for money uh, she initiated it so i do hope she does receive the the reward of everybody that donated but actually i was absolutely dumbfounded when the gofundme account uh, went up to uh, 14,000 plus. Allah, yeah, I, I haven't seen that type of money before Allah. myself. And I was like, again, remember I was telling you about the love that people was uh, showing me with the calls and the text messages and the Instagram messages and whatnot, the face Facebook messages. To see people put money for me, I'm like, like little old me from Catford. I'm from Cat an area called Catford in South East London, you know, near Lewisham and, and those areas right there. I'm like, right, people really care. And it, it, it it affected me it affected me so i was like you know this is um i need to give back now i already had meso up and running as an established business um in the infancy stages so what i did i said you know what i'm gonna give i think i said a hundred uh free places on my course that i charge now 297 for actually that's been my source of income to this day i just gave a hundred uh, spots away for free and then 300 people <laughs> applied for it everyone the most one thing i've learned about the muslims they do like a freebie the yeah, muslims like a good deal, uh, we love a good deal. not even a good deal a freebie <laughs> so, so. <laughs> a freebie is a freebie Achi. you know so, they do love a freebie 300 people um uh, subscribe to the course right and i was literally copy pasting everybody's email into the course it was so monotonous and boring and then after 100 people and i realized why well, there's 300 people i gave another 100 people and that was my small way of saying thank you. Whether you donated or whether you didn't donate, that wasn't my concern. Because when a person donates, they're not doing it necessarily for me, inshallah. They're doing it for the sake of Allah. I, I could have been anybody, but they chose to donate to this cause. And in my, in my, and as a token of my appreciation, I didn't care if you donated or not. Send me your email address, I'll give you free access. And I, I stuck to my word, you know? And that was my, my way of giving back, which was nice, right? <laughs> So um, I, I changed my diet, uh, as I mentioned, Ahi, um, I lost a lot more weight, but this was all in preparation to um, have my colonoscopy that I was telling you about. So before you have an operation like a colonoscopy, Ahi, they have to give you a consultation. This is what I thought I missed out earlier on. All right. So it was the, it was the sorry, the colonoscopy first. It was my procedure now where they were going to cut out my colon. That's not the colonoscopy. The colonoscopy is with the camera. Now they're going to cut out my colon. So they have to give me a... Okay. Go on. What are the implications of cutting out somebody's colon? Exactly. So that's what you need the consultation for. Because okay. now they're going to tell you the implications, the potential ramifications, the risks and stuff like that. So I knew the, 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 the meeting was coming up. And in my head, I said, you know what? I'm going to have all my questions ready. I'm going to be, you know, asking the surgeon this and that and this and that. Actually, it was nothing how I expected it to go. It never went anything, not even remotely how I expected it to go. I went there coming up confident like this, thinking, yeah, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be confident. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, face this challenge face on. I walked out of that room with my head like this. I couldn't even look at my surgeon. And the reason why was 
when I went in there, it was a friendly conversation with the nurse at first, you know, getting the 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 the, the, the regular stuff out of the way. Then he's, she's like, oh, the, the, the surgeon's going to come and see you in a minute. I was like, all right, cool. I wasn't expecting that. Um, or maybe I was, but I wasn't expecting what he was about to do. So he come in and he's like, he introduced himself, Dr. Westcott. And he's like, uh, um, all right, you know, after speaking about everything, he goes to me, um, because of the nature of the surgery, right? If you can imagine where your belly button is, they were going to do, if I'm not mistaken, the, the correct term is keyhole surgery, where they, they insert, go into my body just below my belly button. And she, he said to he said to me because of the nature of the um, the operation and where we're going to be cutting around, you may never be able to use downstairs again. Like it may never work again. And I was like, what? No, it's not happening. Again, it was just my instant reaction. The defenses are coming up now. I feel threatened and I'm scared. You know, I I thought you're going up the other. Like, what's that? What, what's the back got to do with the front kind of thing? So I'm having a hard time because I wasn't expecting that. Now I'm having a hard time just comprehending anything that he's saying after this point. Um, he goes, you know, it shouldn't happen, but we, we, we're we duty bound. That, that, that was the message. We're duty bound to tell you. And I was like, you know, my wife was like, don't worry, it's going to be OK. Like, she was my rock at that stage. And then it was what he said to me next. I mean, if what he just already said wasn't hard enough or, 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 or you know, painful enough to deal with, he said, all right, we just need to do an internal investigation. I said, what do you mean, an internal investigation? What does that mean? He goes, I, basically, I just need to, to check how far the tumour is up your colon. And I said to myself, what is happening? Like, in a, such a sport short, I've never been violated. I, I, I call it violated, but it, that's just a negative way of looking at it. It's not being violated, is it? If, it, if it's, it's a medical procedure. Just like women have internal investigations all the time, especially if they have children or, or whatever. But to me, at the time, I saw it as a violation of like, almost like my manhood to a degree, you know? So he had to do an internal investigation. I can, I cried like a baby. I cried, shaking, like uncontrollably shaking. Because I was like, it was, it was, it was too much, um over a short space of time, you with me? That's what, that's, that's one of the, the, the things that I found um, difficult to deal with about the whole situation. But anyway, um, after that, you know, I remember I told you that I changed my diet. Like I was so, like I couldn't look him in his face. After he did that to him, I couldn't look at him. Like I was, I was broken, proper. Um, after that uh, experience, me and my wife went P.F. Chance. <laughs> I said, yeah, we were PF Chan. Like, that's my favorite spot. That's our favorite spot. Actually, it's that those dynamite prawns, bro. Mm. Like, I and I remember I had stopped eating all types of. I know obviously prawns aren't meat, but I stopped eating fish, meat, chicken, okay. everything. Okay. But I said, Bismillah, let's go, man. After that, I need to go and have some dynamite prawns, right? So we ate, and then we just kind of planned, you know, what the, the, the how we're gonna um move move forward. So um, no sooner than later. Remember that was the end of August, right? Uh, in early September, no sooner than later, maybe about two weeks later, that's when I scheduled my first, um, my surgery. So I had to, obviously I went in there the day before, they'd done everything they had to do. I went in there, actually, if I'm not mistaken, 59 kg. So I'd already lost a significant amount of weight because when I got diagnosed, I was around the 63, 64. Then when I cut out my diet, you know, in preparation for my surgery, I went down to like 58 so that's how much i was roughly about going into the surgery and if you there's a video on, on, on my facebook somewhere you see me i look like when i look at myself now i look skinny and you want to know what is what i did what at the time it, it felt like it added insult to injury before i knew i had cancer i was still teaching so you can go on my personal uh facebook now not my insta my facebook and you can see lessons where i had cancer but i didn't know and i used to get messages from people that i know and there was like definitely one from a sister. I don't know who she is. She messaged me and said, brother, are you okay? Like, you, you look sick. And like, do you know how offensive that is? <laughs> when mm. you don't know that you're sick and somebody's saying that you look sick. It's like, mm. what, what are you trying to say kind of thing? Mm. Um, I forgot to even mention this. I would be, 
I, I used to do Eid events, right? So I used to, I, we, as little, part of Little May Soul, we sell toys and books as well that we author, uh, bilingual books at that. So I used to do a lot of Eid events, right? So when, you, when you're in that circle, I suppose like yourself, when you're in the whole podcast circle and the, the YouTube, uh, Instagram circle, you, you, you know other Instagrammers in your, in your yeah. space. So, you know, these, these Eid events year in, year out, you kind of see the same faces and the same brands. There was one Eid, Achi, one, no, no, one Eid event that I walked past a brother that I know only via him being another uh, a stool holder. And I looked at him and I was like, Salam alaikum, Achi, thinking, like, like, how are you? Like, how are you doing? And he was like, I like, went to walk past. And then he stopped and double ticked. I could have a double, double take. I was like, ah, you, you look different. You lost some weight. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, like, you know, just working out or whatnot. I was taking it as a, a good thing. But these were little signs I was getting. Now that I think back in retrospect, that people were seeing that that gradual change in my in my weight. So anyway, um, they said that they're going to do the surgery, and it goes to me. Okay, they said, look, when we do the surgery, we might need to give you um, a stoma back. And I'm like, well, what's a stoma back? It's like I'm f every time I see these people, like they don't yeah, tell me exactly. nothing good. Yeah. It's yeah. always it's like, but when, and I was like, what? They said, they're going to put this bag on me that I'm going to use to defecate in. And I was like, I, I don't want that. I don't want to be like that. I just want to use mm. what Allah has given me to defecate in, you know. Um, there's like, it's, not a, it's not a definite. It's just a, pre a precautionary measure. So the day before, you know, I had to go up to the nurse and I had to lift up my top. And then she had to draw a line, uh, an X on me where it will go. And then um, I remember going into... Um, the day of the surgery, you know, I think I slept in the hospital uh, the night before, I believe, or I might have went in there the, the same day, I don't remember. I went down, they gave me the anaesthetic, lights out. I don't remember anything after that, nothing at all. The next thing I do remember is waking up. So I'm waking up in this recovery room, disorientated, thinking where I am. The moment, it took about two seconds though. Literally, it was, it was like, it felt super duper fast. The first thing I did, Achi, remember I'm laying down looking up in the, to the ceiling. First thing I do was put my hands on my belly and I felt, you know, like if you had a plastic bag, yeah, like a, a sandwich bag and it's, you blow in it. So it's kind of inflated and you put it underneath your, your top and you tap it. That sound, that kind of sound that it makes. I felt that and I was like, oh man, I got the bag. I got the bag. So anyway, I was like, I got it, what can I do? You have to just, you know, miss me like, to get on with it. So then eventually they got up um, and I was, for the most part, other than my current situation, I was fine. I was able to speak. I wasn't in any pain. I still had a lot of drugs in my system. Aki, by the way, if it's if it's getting a bit too long, please let me know. Yeah. No, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. I'm just making sure, I'm just keep checking to make sure that my camera and my equipment's still on. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that was the situation. Now I had the thing, came back up and I was eating fine. I was eating fine. Um, I was talking. I wasn't. I didn't get out of my bed because uh, I was. I was obviously sore, and I didn't know at the time that they had about four four things going into me. They had what obviously my stoma bag, which is where your intestines come out your your belly a little bit. That's where you defecate from. They had another um, uh, cord for some strange reason coming up my my left side. They had another uh, wire going into my just above, just like your pubic area right there. They had another one, uh, I think it's called a catheter, if I'm not mistaken, that actually goes into your privates. So like, I was just like, I didn't want to move. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, mm -hmm. how am I going to even walk anyway? You know what I mean? So I just literally stayed there. Food will come to me and whatnot. And because the drugs still kicked in, I wasn't in any pain and I was able to eat. Um, but I wasn't defecating. Because what's happened is my bowels and my intestines, everything went to sleep. So when I walk back up now, it's not working as it should be working. But I tell you something, my brother, when they started to work again and they started to wake up, the pain was out of this world. That's where a lot of the trauma came for me. It was the pain that I went through after my surgery and not necessarily dealing with the fact that I'm a cancer patient. That's difficult to deal with, yeah, no, no doubt. But it was the pain and the reason why I went through so much pain was because, and this is what was explained to me actually from the, the professionals, when they initially cut me, let's say for example, they cut, they cut my hole like this, right? A hole in my belly like this, and then my intestines was poking out like that. <laughs> they cut me when I'm sleeping. So naturally when you're, well, 
unconscious. When you're unconscious, your muscles are relaxed. So the, the, the hole that they gave me was sufficient for how my body was at the time. But now, because I'm young, and when I woke up now, everything's starting to contract again, the hole closed up. So you can imagine when I wanted to defecate, and again, it's an involuntary uh, defecation. You just don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when you're going to pass wind from that area, just like you would pass wind normally, but it just comes out of there. It's the most embarrassing thing. That led me not to want to go outside once I got out of hospital. And it just comes out. So I would be talking to you right now, and then I just might just go like, oh, gosh, I need to change my bag. Are you with me? It's like that. So, um, so, so do you have that now? Alhamdulillah, I don't, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't, I don't. It's, um, it's something that some people live with it. For, some people have to have it. If my cancer was further down my colon, right near the entrance, they would have had to remove my colon, which means I wouldn't have been able to hold my stool no more. So right now, they, could, they, they took out like seven, 17 centimetres. I think they went seven centimetres up above the cancerous tumour, seven centimetres down. So I've got, my, 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 my colon's going to be uh, slightly uh, uh, sm shorter than the average colon, which means that if I need to go toilet, number two, I'm going to, I can't hold it as much as other people may be able to hold it. So if I need to go, I need to go kind of thing, especially if it's number two. So um, when, they, when, my, when my intestines and my body and my muscles started to contract again, I was in severe pain, right? <sighs> Horrid, horrid experience, Echi. And again, like I said, and I want to emphasize that the trauma that came wasn't from the, the cancer. It was from that experience there. But they didn't know. Imagine this. I'm experiencing all this pain that I shouldn't be experiencing. And the doctors don't know why. You know, they say, no, 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 you should be okay. And I'm saying, I'm in pain. Like, I need, give me, they put me on this, um, I forget what it's called now. It's like, you can press this button every, morphine, that's it. They put me on morphine, but it's every five minutes I can press it and it'll give me a boost, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. will help. Um, but the pain was out of this world. I was on another strong drug that I forget what it's called now. It's like the strongest drugs that you can give a, a, a patient at the time. And I was on two forms of anti-sicknesses, anti-sickness tablets. In fact, one was a tablet, one was an injection. Akhi al-Habib, Faisal, as you probably know, the moment you inject anything into your veins into your directly into your veins that goes into your blood and stuff it's gonna get into your body significantly faster than taking a tablet because a tablet has to go through your digestive system and be broken down and stuff like that before it gets to where it needs to go this um this uh particular anti-sickness would make me go blind for maybe like 10 minutes Whoa. Uh, actually i couldn't i couldn't even see my phone when i took it I didn't tell them at the time, and I'll tell you why I didn't tell them in a little while. I couldn't see my phone. Once they put it in me, it was the best feeling ever, and I couldn't see my phone. I would have to say to my wife at the time, All right, just press this button, and then eventually my, my eyesight will come back. Um, and the reason why I didn't tell them that I was experiencing that, because what they gave me felt so good, right? It felt so good. For that 10, 15 minutes, it allowed me to escape what I was going through at that time. And I was scared at that time of them taking it away from me. So I just kept it to myself. But as a result of that, you know, um, the, the, the heavy drugs that they were given, the ramifications of that, whilst it was kind of helping with the pain, um, I started to have serious hallucinations, Akhi. Like hallucinating like as, 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 as real as you are right now in front of me in the computer screen. I would see things, I'm sleeping, but I'm thinking I'm awake. And I would say, for example, there's times where um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm awake. I know my wife's there, I know my sister's there, and I'm like, how, how, how do I turn on the washing machine? All right? And she'll be like, what washing machine? I say, and it's like, when somebody questions me, then I, then I hear myself, and I'm Right, I, I was like, I really just saw a washing machine. I, on one occasion, I saw a bearded woman walk in the room. I said, what was this, is this woman with a beard? On one occasion, I saw my kids walk in the room. And I knew that my, that day, my kids were with my older sister. So I said to my wife, how come the kids are here? I thought they were with, with my sister Dawn. She goes, nobody's here. It was stuff like that, you know. And I think all of, and again, I'm giving you the summarized version. I was in hospital in total for like two and a half months. One month, then I came out for a little bit, went back into A&E, came back out, then I went back in again. 
um, um, all of this is what contributed to the trauma that I'm still getting over to this day. Does that make sense? It's not the cancer. The cancer didn't hurt. You don't feel the cancer. You know, you might feel tired, uh, blood in the stool and stuff like that. But the pain was because the surgery, they, were, they, 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 made, they made an error. To no fault of their own, but they made an error. So it got so bad, Akhi, and I'm going to like tell you some things that I've never shared before, bro. It got so bad, as you can imagine. Well, let me ask you the question, Akhi. Imagine if you, you need to go number two right but it can't come out can't come out your right end and it's not coming out of your intestines where do you think it's going to come out where's the only other place for it to come out the front nope the mouth your mouth <laughs> when i was in hospital before it actually happened to me there was a jamaican gentleman right who was on the other side and it's weird like when you're sick you kind of have like this connection with other sick people. You with me? It's like we're going through this together. And I would hear him like shouting out, nurse, nurse. And then, you know, I just vomited out my mouth again. Um, and then I could hear, you, you can hear everyone's business in, in, those, in those wards. I, I got to realise that he was vomiting faeces. And in my head, I'm like, I've only got this. And I was somebody actually that I was just so like, um, you know, just, I just didn't want to see anybody. I want to see no doctors or no nurses. So I would always have my curtains shut. Mm. Seldom, seldom actually would I open up my curtains. Only if they said, oh, Mr. Beaumont, do you mind opening up your curtains? So, because I, I always ask for a window. <laughs> I was trying to make the best out of a bad situation. I'm like, look, if I'm here, at least let me look outside. You get me? I'm young. I, I need to see something. I need to be inspired by something. And that view there of the canary, I think it's, what's that, what's that thing called, uh, the will? Um, London, no, Eye. The, London Eye. That's what I could see from my hospital bed. Okay. Every single night. Oh, okay, That's of what, course, because you was in South. I was, yeah, exactly. I think it was uh, St. Thomas's I was in. Um, and that I, think there, that's where, I think that's where Boris Johnson is right now. Oh, for real? Yeah. Okay. Um, that there is where, um, I have, I've had a lot of memories there, because it was a beautiful scenery for when Fajr was coming um, in or out. Oh, when Maghrib is, that's, they are the emotions that I, I, I um, associate with that place. Anyway, until I started vomiting feces out my mouth, actually, and I didn't know what it was, because it, does, it doesn't smell like feces. It doesn't even look like feces. Until one day, um, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I can't think. My, my stomach it doesn't look like a pregnant woman, but it feels like I'm pregnant. Like, face it, if you, was, if you came to visit me in the hospital during that time, and you walked past my bed and you just so happened and it happened with my wife may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her for her patience and you so happen to hit the side uh, of my bed with your hip I am in agony and I'm um, I'm just really fiery because it's the pain I was like, I like why, why would you do that to me kind of thing and she's like no I didn't do it on purpose but at the time remember I got the drugs in my system I'm hallucinating you know I'm being tested spiritually mentally physically in every sphere in my of my life like why is anybody else causing me pain right now um but then sometimes i'll be fine when they when the medications kicked in and then um what happened was we didn't feel that we were getting the care that we needed like why my mom and my, my wife and my, my father why is my son in so much pain it's not normal um and nothing seemed to be happening so they went and complained there's a section in the hospital that you can complain about i forget the name of it if i'm not mistaken actually that night the surgeon came up and we've since have got a, like a good relationship. He came up and said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what's happened. All right. But what we're going to do, we're going to put you back on the, under the uh, operating theater and we're going to try and sort this out for you. I promise. So I felt like, oh, alhamdulillah, you know, at least I'm not a, just a lost cause. Sure. And nobody's, you know, seeing to the, my, my situation. So it was about two to three weeks I went back under. And again, even that in and of itself, actually, like you, you cut somebody around that area of the body, it takes a long time to heal. It's almost like getting a caesarean, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then they went back in three weeks later. So to this day, actually, which has been nearly two years or maybe nearly two years, I still have pain there. For, like I can't do a sit up by myself, you know. Um, so if I'm laying in the bath sometimes, I don't know what it is, the hot water, it makes it feel really sore. So if I get up, I'm in, I'm in agony. Um, they put me back under the uh, operating theatre and they basically just opened up the hole. That's when I found out that my hole for the stone was initially too, too small. 
you with me so that was um you know all of that drama but as it relates to actually living with a stoma that was the second phase of my whole journey with cancer which brought me into even more depression because i said to myself look i'm somebody that teaches and I'm, i go out and do things how am i gonna what am i gonna do if i'm on the street and my bag fills up and i need to empty it I, what do i do do you see what I'm saying? And to empty, actually, was the most, for me, it was the most painful experience because you have to take off the bag. I still had stitches that they wanted to pull out. I said, there's no way you're pulling out, no stitches out. Let them dissolve naturally, you know. Um, you have to wipe it. And in the process of you taking off that stoma bag, Achi, you don't know if you're going to defecate. You don't know if you're going to defecate. And it's the most humiliating for me, I, again, at the time where my mind was and everything that was happening at the time. I just felt so humiliated. I felt like, I felt, I felt like I went back to like infancy, that baby stages. And on two occasions, right, you, you start to get um, uh, uh, paranoid. Do I smell? Like, cause you can smell, like sometimes I could smell it if I change it or maybe if I went like that, I could smell a little whiff. Like can, if other people around me, can they smell? Smell me. So I'm thinking now, oh, when I get out of it, I'm staying at home. I'm not going anywhere. Nobody coming to see me. And I definitely ain't going to see nobody, you know? Um, on two occasions, actually, and this was probably uh, one of the lowest uh, points. My, my my bag, one 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 occasion, I woke up and my bag had over uh, overfilled, so it spilled out onto me. Another occasion, it um uh it 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 spilled when I was when I was changing it. So you can imagine I'm sleeping one day in the hospital bed, and they're not the most comfortable places to 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 be in, and then I wake up. And then I just feel a nice warm sensation, <laughs> as bad as it sounds. I feel a nice warm sensation on my body area. And I'm like, what's that? So I'm looking down, and obviously the covers are there. I can't, I'm disorient. You still there, bro? Yeah, sorry, my phone just, oh, there we are. I was a bit disorientated. Um, and then it wasn't until I lifted up the covers and I could see that literally the, uh, my thesis, and it was really, it was, wa it was like water. It was almost like, like literally the consistency was like water. It doesn't come out like stool comes out. It comes out like water, right? And it was just pouring down and I'm like, like, I just had to sit there. I just had to sit there until it finished. And I can't remember if it was the first time or the second time. But one of the time I cried, actually, because I was like, yeah, of course. this, it, this is just, it's, it feels like it's, it's too much. And it was either the first time it happened or the second time when I was actually awake this time, but I was changing myself. So I'm sitting down, I'm, I'm wiping all the feces off. That was, you know, the little bits of like residue from the thing. I threw away the bag. And um, as I'm going to get the new bag to put on, because you can, you can have a bag for about two days. You just okay. empty it. Yeah, you just empty it out, empty it out, empty it out. Um, but once it gets a bit like over two days, one, two days, like depending on how, how much it's been, how active it's been, you kind of want to change it now. And you feel a bit fresh when you've got a new one on. So I'm trying to rush, 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 rush. And in the, in, the, in, in, in the interim period of me cleaning up, trying to get the new one, I just went, I just saw it go like this. I'm gonna, I, don't know, can you, I don't know if you can see me. I just felt, I'm going to go up here because this is where the camera cuts off. But it just went, it just splurted like, like a water pistol. You know, like if you press the water pistol once and it just squirts out. It squirted out. So you, you, so you have no... Control. Feeling of like, oh, when I'm it's about coming, to... Definitely. Nothing nothing actually you feel when it's coming out but you don't know that it's coming you with me so yeah, naturally, you don't have like that like uh, like when you need to go to the bathroom to you're toilet, like, uh, exactly or something you know if you need to pass wind you kind of feel that oh, i got some gas in my stomach or a burp you kind of feel it coming up this one you don't so naturally as i'm changing and it went like that my instinct was to catch it <laughs> that's what you do right you, just catch, you go to catch something so i went to catch it and it's like and then it just went Ksh. Then it was like a waterfall. And it just went all in between my legs, all behind me again. And I cried, I think that was the time when I cried, that time there. Um, so obviously I had to clean up all my hands to the best of my ability. I'm feeling nasty, I smell. I pressed the buzzer, probably done it, done it with my knuckle or something like that. And then I said to the nurse, oh, like I've, you know, I've, I've sold myself, I need some help. And I'm angry now. I'm just angry because this period, I'm just angry and just, you know, um, like a grumpy person. I'm not the nicest person to be around. Um, and I remember one of the times that I had to get changed, it was, a, it was a female nurse. What can I do? 
what can I do, Akhi? I'm like near enough incapacitated. I can't do much. It was like late at night. Uh, she was the only one on duty. And another time, I had to get a man to do it. That day, Akhi, was difficult for me to deal with. Like, do you know what I mean? I remember, um, I do feel bad now because obviously I'm, I'm in my right frame of mind. But at the time, I'm not. He, I told him, he's like, okay, no problem. This is, this is their job, NHS staff. This is what they have to do, work, deal with on a daily basis, you know? He came in after I told him, and he go, he went to open up the curtains when I wasn't presentable. So I shouted at him, and he just, like, kind of shot like that. And at the time, I'm not even thinking about how he feels, or that he's just doing his job, or how I'm coming across. I'm just like, why are you opening up the curtains and I'm not, do you know what I mean? So I had to get out the thing, they changed, wiped it down. Before you knew it, um, I was back in my uh, back in my bed. But those were, you know, two um, very, very difficult and traumatic experiences that I had with the, uh, the, the, the stoma bag. So, so we, right now we're talking the year 2018, am I correct? That's correct, my brother. Fine. So you've had the surgery now. And how long did the period last between, you know, okay, it's 2018, uh, tw uh, 25th of August, I believe you said you got diagnosed, um, and then you had the surgery eventually, and now uh, between then and um, the uh, you originally, um, how did you come to find about find out that you um, at that point were on the mend and that you that that what it seemed like that the worst had gone and uh, inshallah you know it, it, as far as i'm aware from your story it, it, it seemed like a, perhaps the cancer had gone okay. am i correct uh, there are some elements that are correct and some elements that are uh, Fine. incorrect okay. yeah okay. and that's cool so um so after that after the whole uh, period um i was pushing for uh, a reversal all right a reversal i.e for them to allow me to use my my natural you know, bodily parts. To, oh, okay, to oh, fine. So that's possible, is it? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. It, but it was to always ask for a, it. No, but it's always sorry. It's always temporary if your colon doesn't have to be removed entirely. I see. It's it, it's just when they do it. I see. And I had it. I had it for free, maybe four months, and I wanted it off because I said, look, they 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 do periodic tests, and there was no sign of there any of of there being any leakages in my in my in my system or anything like that um and they was you know they was doing their ct scans and their pet scans and at that time they still couldn't see anything so i'm like Khalas, you know let me let me put me back to how i was kind of thing so we had a, a meeting and he said he said to me i went when i went in i was 45 kg now imagine i'm 45 kg at this stage because i'm depressed i'm not going out i'm arguing with anybody that comes in you know family members had a hard time some of them gave me uh, sympathy some of them gave me tough love and i needed everything i needed both you know i needed both um uh, extremes you know um so when i went back in for the reversal now i it was like uh, no worry it was like about december -ish, I, I, I think i went for, the, for a consultation he goes to me i went there and he's like yeah all right i don't see no reason why we can't do it. I started crying, Akhi. Because I was like, my life at the time, my existence, my happiness was contingent on this one word this, or this this one acceptance saying, yeah, right, we'll do it back. It's like, it's, it was too much power for somebody to have over me. So I just cried, you know. And he's like, when, I say it's like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. He said, like, when do you want to um, do it? I said, I'll stay right now. I'll sleep right now tonight in the hospital. And they're like looking around saying, uh, is it possible? All right, let's check if you've got some beds. I was ready to, to, to drop what I was doing and stay. Um, yeah, unfortunately, exactly, do you know what I mean? Uh, unfortunately, they never had no beds. So they said, all right, come back another day. I came back another day. Still never had no beds. And then by the time they told me to come back for the last time, that's when, uh, alhamdulillah, they managed to... Um, uh, perform the the surgery. Sorry, Ahi. What was the 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 direct question that you uh, mentioned? The question I asked was kind of so uh, the timeline in that we're in December twenty eighteen now. In that oh, yeah. you're getting yeah, and so 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 how long did it take for you to get to that stage uh, that you. I mentioned? And what was that stage? Because because you mentioned that some of the information was on and some of it was off. So what what ended up yeah, happening in in that? That's regard? it. So in the in that period, I was like periodically getting checked and stuff like that, and 
when they were checking me, I do remember on another occasion, uh, my surgeon saying, you, you might be cured. You know, some people can go through surgery and it's sufficient. Some people go through the chemo and it's successful. Some people go through chemo and it's not successful. Um, the danger is you just never know. So um, when he said that to me, that was like the first indication that alhamdulillah, they can't see anything. So what happened to me was I kind of dropped the baton. You know, I dropped the ball if I'm honest, because I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay again. Whilst I still didn't indulge in fizzy drinks um, and I still didn't eat meat, you know, I did start eating chicken well, around again. What time are we talking here? So we're looking at. Um, so if I got the if I got the uh, I got diagnosed in August. I had the operation in September. I had my reversal in December. So around December January time. Fine. Of two thousand and nineteen. So the the latter period of two thousand eighteen going into two thousand nineteen. So I'm like, um, you know, inshallah, I'm better. So I started to get a bit laxed. If like pizza was ordered. I would maybe have a, a bite or two, you know. And um, what happened was, I remember one day I went to the toilet. And what happened, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm so, like, conscious of the whole blood in the stool thing, because that's a major sign. I'm always, even to this day, if I go to the toilet, I, I, I'm, I'm checking to see, you know, is there, if there's any signs. The body's of amazing. Of course, I, hear, I heard that the health, health care professionals kind of mentioned that that's an important thing for people to do generally, just to check the health of their that's stool. That's it. That's it, because it comes from every, every they say, and I, I could be uh, mistaken in this, but all sicknesses uh, begin in the gut. So anything that you're going to be, you know, excreting from your body, which has come from your gut, you know, it's an indication of how well, you know, your, 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 your body's working. So, um, yeah, so I, I dropped the baton, I dropped the ball, um, I got a bit lackadaisical, and I think I went for just a random checkup, everything was fine. Then the next is like every six months or so, or every four or five months. The next checkup I, I uh, went for, they said that um, they've seen, I got a call. Because they give you the scan, then you get a call on, on, on a Tuesday. Because on a Monday, they have what they call an MDM, if I'm not mistaken, which is a multidisciplinary meeting. Where all of the surgeons and oncologists, they get together and they study everybody's cases who've been, you know, uh, had a, a scan the week before. So I always get my calls on a Tuesday, so I'm waiting for Tuesday to come. And after my scan, I didn't hear nothing for a good three weeks. So I'm thinking, alhamdulillah, everything's, I'm in the call. I don't feel sick. I still feel normal. So um, I get the call one day and I didn't start, I don't start, I didn't start the number in at the first time, but I recognize their number whenever they call. So I picked up the phone. It's like, hi, Mr. Bowman, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm not bad. I just want to say cut to the chase, you know, like, how, how's it? What was, the, what was the situation saying? And she said that, um, and this this conversation here I actually recorded and I actually shared it online and it's actually on my page somewhere. Um, so you're hearing me live. You don't see me, but you hear me live. Um, sorry, I, I recorded it and I put it up as a, as a voice note, sorry. But you hear my reaction. She said, hi, Mr. Bowman. We've seen from your scans, we've seen some um, some something that looks, con she used the word like conspicuous conspicuous and I'm like, are we well, talking six months after the january period now so we're around july 2019 um let me see now no when she told me this this news that i got here was about four months ago from today where we are now so from january 2019 uh yeah 2019 all the way through to maybe say december you thought you was in the clear i thought i was good I thought I was good on the mend. Do you know what I mean? Still in a lot of pain from the stoma. Um, eventually started going back to work. Eventually started um, uh, teaching. Um, what was beautiful, Akhi, though, what was beautiful about this whole experience, and I, I, I alluded to this in the beginning, and I said that, you know, not all things that seem bad are really bad. Because, yeah, the cancer is bad on the face of it, but so many beautiful things were born as a result. It's definitely changed me as a person and made me more sympathetic and made me more in tune with my body and my health. And subsequently, my family members, we have to. Our diets have changed. Um, Little May Saw as an academy was born from that. And it was literally one word that my wife said, hey, why don't you ask so-and-so if you can use the local community? Just that, Achi. Then that's how we actually started the physical location. 
we moved from that physical location and we eventually went to a, um, a registered uh, primary school, Ofsted registered building. You know, so not everything that looked that's doom and gloom on it on the on the face of it has to end that way. So anyway, um, I thought I was good for like a good year, nine, ten months. Then I had another scan. I never heard from them for a long time, and then it must have been in December, if I'm not mistaken, two thousand and nineteen. I may be getting my dates mixed up, or January two thousand and twenty, that I got the call, and that's when the lady said that on your latest scan, we've seen something that looks a bit conspicuous and um, we want to give you a PET scan. So I think they gave me a CT scan, now they want to give me a PET scan. And they described it as, it's just another way, a more detailed scan of looking at the same thing from a different angle. So um, they done that and then they called, they called me up and said, um, yeah, the PET scan has shown that you've got some uptake. Again, these are all terminologies. I'm like, well, what does uptake mean? What does conspicuous yeah. mean in this context? I know what conspicuous means normally, but um, in this con in the medical context, what does it mean? Uh, you've got some uptake and uh, you've got some, uh, your lymph nodes. That's what she said. Your lymph nodes appear to be, or some, some of your lymph nodes around your groin area, right and left, appear to be malignant. That's another fancy term for cancerous. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So it's just and like, she said this to you on the phone? On the phone. Should do are they supposed to do that or not? I don't know. Me personally, I didn't mind. I didn't mind. I'd rather know than tell me to come and face to face. How, and how did that make you feel as soon as you? I know you said you had the recording, but I haven't heard it. Yeah. What was going through your head? Was you with your wife, your family? At yeah, the time? I, I was. I was. Yeah, she was right next to me. My heart dropped. My heart sunk. But I've always said to myself that you know, um, the first time I went through it, I was like. You know, if I, if I look back and say, how did I deal with it? I dealt with it okay. Could I have been more patient? Yes. Could I have had more tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. You know, there's so many things that I could have done better looking back in retrospect. But because you're in it, you don't necessarily look at it so objectively because you're just trying to get through. So I said to, I've always said to myself, you know, if it comes back again, then inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to show Allah that I'm going to be patient with it. So, um... Does it get me down? Yes, I'm a human being. Do you know what I mean? Uh, 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 another benefit or another uh, something that's been, you know, a beautiful experience that has happened on the back of me having cancer is that my son was born. I never expected when I was going through that, the, the, the crux of this trial to ever see another child. I wanted one, but I never thought. Remember, I got told I'd never be able to use it again. Yeah. To thinking I was going to die. To, you know, alhamdulillah, being able to perform hajj for another time. To starting up an academy, you know, which is educating over 60 kids. Walillah, alhamdulillah, shukr. To now having another baby. How can I not be grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me? Because oftentimes, akhi, when we have a blessing, or when Allah sends blessings, we never ever say, Allah, why? Why are you blessing me like this? You just say, alhamdulillah, and you accept the blessing. So similarly, when we get tested... We should also adopt that same type of mindset and say, Alhamdulillah, because, like I said again, Akhi, oftentimes, from trauma, from stress, from frustration, beautiful things happen. And that's what we have to believe. And we just have to trust in the process. Ultimately, first and foremost, trust in Allah, trust in the process, and have that firm conviction that everything's going to be okay. And inshallah ta'ala, there's something better and greater waiting on the other side. So now that I've been re-diagnosed with cancer, I don't want to deal with it how I dealt with it before, i.e. being a recluse and staying in my house and, you know, not mixing up with anybody and, you know, not returning calls and stuff like that. I said, nah, this time I'm going to be the total opposite. I tell you something though, Akhi, and this is something that I feel comfortable saying, because like, I'm not going to be mentioning any specific names, all right? But just generally speaking, um, and again, I would have been so you know, unaware of this, even my own actions to other people, had I not been a victim of this myself. You see, when I was in hospital, Akhi, you know, the one of the people that I kept thinking about, that um, also recently, when I say recently in the past, you know, when I got diagnosed, like a year or two years prior, that was in a similar situation with a different type of cancer, but was also, um, you know, inshallah ta'ala, he, he, he became instrumental in the, the ummah, was our brother um, Ali Banat, Allah Yarahamu. So I remember seeing that video and I remember feeling sorry for the brother, like, 
like it was inspiring how he turned his life around and the the charitable actions that he got into and the, the charitable, charitable deeds that he did um you know he had a fantastic story that he was like a millionaire if i'm not mistaken and he kind of just like left all that alone um but it was also sad in a, in a sense that you saw somebody's health slowly deteriorating until ultimately it caused his demise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him, raise his Ameen. ranks, give, his, give him, him and his family paradise and make it Ameen. easy for the family. But one thing that I started to... Um, there was a, 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 a time when resentment kicked in. Not for Allah, ever. Not one time, akhi, through this situation, when Allah, alhamdulillah, shukran. And I'm actually... I'm, I'm proud of myself for this. I've never said Allah why. Ever said Allah why. But where the resentment kicked in for a minute was for certain people that I know. And I tell you why, Akhi, I'm in a hospital bed, right? As I told you, I told you the state that I'm in, I'm soiling myself, I'm vomiting feces out my mouth. And I think about my brother Ali Banat, and I'm like, you know, he done, He went through what he went through. Um, he done, mashallah, he done what he needed to do in his life. May Allah accept it from him. Amen. When, when he passed away, what happened at most, at most, Akhi, for the next three weeks, at most, at most, he got Facebook. Um, sorry, stuff for I should take that back. People, mashallah, built wells in his names. Mashallah, tabarakallah, and that's that's fantastic. But in terms of like people, most most, most most common, most common, right? Like the most regular the, thing that happened. The most common, it, it was like Facebook posts, right? Posting a video, posting a status, or whatever the case may be. And I said to myself that I, it's almost as if I could see the Facebook posts that are going to be. It's almost I could see the Facebook post and I'm like, I said to myself, like, I don't want no Facebook posts. If I die, I don't, I don't want people to post on, on Facebook. People are going to do it. Even if I say right now, Akhi, if I pass away, I don't want no Facebook posts. And all of the people that see this video, see hear me saying this, people will still do it. All right. So I don't have no control over that. I don't want it. It's not something that I want anybody to do. But people do it. And this is their way of like, commemorating somebody and I'm like to some of the people that I, I, I consider to be close to me I don't want no Facebook post come and see me because I might die right now you feel what I'm saying Akhi? so when there was certain individuals or brothers who I deemed to be close that didn't come to see me during that time where no one knew it was touch and go Akh. it was touch and go I said like if I pass away you're never gonna see me again in this life ever facts we may see some we, we may see some we may see each other in the afterlife but that's not even a guaranteed why wouldn't you want I, I couldn't get my head around it why wouldn't you want to come and see me but you, you definitely want to go and send up you know what i mean you're going to come to you might you, you might come to my janaza but you don't want to come see me so i was battling some demons i came out of that hospital resentful you know i came out of resent uh, family members Akhi. i never saw some family members so i was really bitter I was sick, weak, destroyed, depressed, and bitter. And that's a terrible concussion. Dark mm -hmm. place, Akhi, man. It's a dark place. And what eventually happened is, as I started to get better, and my mind started to get back to normal, those people that were there for me, physically, those people that I know, those people that I don't know that come to check me, Akhi, there were people that were coming to see me in the hospital. I, I couldn't even tell you their names. They just saw the story, they found out where I was, they come to see me. A student that I, I, I met in Medina, he was from Birmingham, I think he actually lives in another country, he was in the UK, he come to see me. So I'm like, how is this possible? Like these guys, I don't really know you guys like, like, like that, like I've known this person for 10, 15 years. What, what's causing him to come visit and you not to come visit? The shaitan is my best friend right now. And all of like the, the worst possible things you can think of, like, right, do they want me to die? Is that what they want? Is it? Uh, what is it? At face, and I was confused. And in that time, I don't think I'm ready to speak about this now. But there was a good brother. His name's Fawad from Brixton Masjid area. He's like an older uncle to a lot of my generation of brothers. And you know, he's the first one. If you're sick, he's coming to visit you with the zamzam or his his wife's. Uh, soup that she makes mashallah to make sure you're right and um 
I remember on one occasion, right? I had, you know those those things that you put over your eyes when you when you're um on the plane or you're trying to get some sleep, right? Those little sh those shutter things. I remember I was sleeping and I had those over my eyes, and the brother he came, and I was I still had the thing over my eyes, but I had my family around me. My wife was there, my mum was there, and whatnot, and he came with the zam zam and everything else, and I was awake, but I had to, I was trying to get some some rest. I just remember him putting his hand either on my forehead, yeah, I think it was on my forehead, or on my chest, or it could have been on my belly, where the, 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 the illness is. And he started doing his adhkar and making ruqia, and I had a mini reaction. You know, later on, you know, maybe in a future episode, we can speak about that. Because that day is still really, really thin, because it, it, there was um, multiple times I had the ruqia done, that, um, you know, there were, there were, there were, there were some you know, concerning, concerning um, change or things that happened at the time. But anyway, I was bitter, bro. I was really bitter. And it was as I got better, I started to realize that when somebody's like sick, like I was, and people don't reach out or people don't come to see you, it's not because they don't love you or they don't care. You know, it's because some p different people deal with trauma in different ways. Sorry. Do you know what I mean? Some people may not want, want not have wanted to see me like that. But I was taking it personally, mm. but it wasn't. It wasn't anything personal. I don't know who's getting up in the third part of the of the, of the night and beseeching Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to cure me and to make it easy for me and my family. I don't know. You with me? But at the time, I wasn't looking at it from that perspective. And this goes to show the importance in life of having a good positive perspective in life. You know, because I've looked at myself and said, well, during my you know fifteen, sixteen years as a Muslim. I have heard of brothers being in hospital, but I haven't gone to visit. But I've made du'a for them, or yeah, at the very least, I felt like bad inside. Like, oh, hope Allah makes it easy for him. What's stopping that brother from looking at me and saying, you know, and, and painting me with that same brush that I'm now painting other people with? But it was so difficult, Akhi. I'm telling you, man, it was so difficult until the point where I just had to let it go because it was consuming me. And the more I held on to it, the more I was becoming bitter and resentful and it was just eating me up. It was mashing me up, actually. So I had to let go of that. And um, I learned a lot from that lesson there. I learned a, a, a lot a, a lot from that. And, you know, and I'll tell you something, another beautiful thing on the back of all of this. Somebody's commitment to their faith, right? How religious they come across, you know, how religious they are is something that's between them and Allah. How much a person grows his beard, obviously, is important. How a person observes having their ankles, uh, their trousers above their ankles, again, which is important. And there are other elements of the deen which are important on a um, face for face value, what you see on the, the outside of things, right? But I noticed that a lot of people that were showing me like crazy love are not necessarily the most quote unquote practicing people. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and again, I'm going through a transition, just coming out of Medina, a year out, you know, um, and I'm seeing that, you know what, like, obviously we're supposed to be religious and we're supposed to be dedicated to our faith and stuff like that, but I'm not judging anybody because everybody's got good in them, just like everybody's got bad. And I just started to take the approach that I'm going to choose, and it's a choice, to look for the good and where I can, try to the best of my ability uh, to overlook the bad. Do you know what I'm saying? You know what, bro? It, it, it makes uh, the work that you do so much more important with that experience that you're talking about because just on what you discussed now, the idea of, of, of character, and some people may not be the most religious, but they came to see you and they, they may, perhaps they dealt with you in a way in which you were pleased with um, at the time or what you mm. felt you needed. It mm. goes to show that the work that you do when you're not just teaching Arabic but you're giving these children tarbiyah, it gives mm. hope for the next generation that that tarbiyah that they get, they might, mm. as we know, even even uh, the best of generations, they would come to the Prophet wasallam, and sometimes they fe would feel that their iman is low and sometimes they feel like their iman is higher. But that tarbiyah is what carries you through sure. sometimes. And the fact that you're able yeah. to give that tarbiyah to children to say when your friend is sick, you go and visit them. And then perhaps when their That's iman yeah. is low... They might be struggling with yeah. some basics, but they will go and visit their sick friend. Subhanallah. Um, uh, Ismail, I, I, yes. I wanted to ask you two things. And um, 
one of them is uh, I'll, okay I'll ask you the, this one first uh, feel free to not answer it in fact both of them are quite personal so feel free not to answer either of them but the first one is um, you were, you said you were re-diagnosed in perhaps January this year it's very very recent bro a few months back that's uh, it. to the point where that's we could it. probably all we could probably all um, even remember what we were doing in January uh, what's life been that's like true. from then and now yeah um, again I, I believe that and I hope I don't offend anybody uh, by what I'm about to say I believe and it has it's, it's something that has, has been you know it's a it's, it's a it's a mindset that has come over time I believe that weakness actually is a choice I believe weakness in my head I do believe that weakness is a choice I've been re-diagnosed right I can't do anything about that all I can do is try to clean up my diet again and make sure I take my vitamins and supplements and stuff like that which my what I wanted to add a little while ago some of the most unsuspecting people have been the, 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 at the forefront and giving me this stuff you know all of these vitamins that I need to help with my body right um, I can't do anything but what I can do what I do have control over is how I choose to deal with the situation you with me I've had it once before. My mindset, I've had it once before and it didn't kill me. Inshallah ta'ala, it's not going to kill me again. But it's an ilayhi ta'ala. You with me? I've got no choice but to be strong. Because the other option leads me down a dark hole. And I don't want to go back there. But it's easy to go. This is why I'm so meticulous with who I'm hanging around with. What I allow myself to do. Actually, even this podcast right now, naturally... I'm not somebody that's like, I've, I've begun to get more confident and become out there. But it's not something that I would, you know, normally do. You with me? Um, other people have asked me to do podcasts as well around the time. But in my head, you know, I, I just couldn't help but think that it was the story. People want content. And it was just a negative way of thinking. And this is why... Um, I just wasn't ready, number one, to share my story. I wanted to respect my wife's uh, privacy. Um, and I'm like, no, I, I don't want to be, I don't just want to be out there for the sake of it. But now I feel like I'm healing. And it is kind of therapeutic speaking about it. Some things I can speak about, some things I can't. So how I'm, you know, choosing to deal with it now since the re-diagnosis in January is I'm not going to be weak. If I'm going to pass away Faisal, I'm gonna it's gonna it's gonna happen just like it's gonna happen to you just like it's gonna happen to every single one of the, every, every everyone that we know so that's not nothing that I need to be over concerned about what I need to be over overly concerned about is how I pass away in what state I pass away and what legacy did I leave on this earth why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the ability to be here you understand that what I'm trying to say Ari? I believe that I have a lot of control over that and that's with the decisions that I, I, I choose to do. And behavior is a choice. Being weak is a choice. You with me? I somewhat control how you perceive me by the way I act, by the way I speak, by the way I carry myself. Does that make sense, Aki? Um, can I just mention one thing, if you don't mind, my bro? One of the things I'm still working on after coming out of cancer is um, it changed me from other people's point of view. But to me, it didn't change me. I just, I just got with the program. And when, you know, may Allah protect you and your family, if, you, if, if, if somebody's faced with um, a life-threatening disease, right, your priorities change so. in, a, in a heartbeat. So now what my focus is, I mean, I've always tried to be somebody striving for paradise, but now I'm on overdrive. I still have my days. I still have my days because I'm a human being, but I'm on overdrive right now. And oftentimes people don't understand that. You with me? If I, I give you an example. Let's say that, you know, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm still growing. I'm still working on myself as a person. But let's say somebody post cancer now brings some kind of drama into my life. And I say to myself, wait a minute. In my head, when I prioritize everything, I'm saying, I'm trying to get to paradise. I don't know the next time I'm going to get the call to say it's spread. It's in your lymph nodes now. It's spread to your lungs. It's spread to your kidneys. It's spread to this part. Do you see what I'm saying, Naki? That's the cloud that I got over my head. So I could choose to be like, oh gosh, right. Or I can say, you know what? If Allah wills for it to happen, it's going to happen. I can't control that. 
let me just focus on those aspects of my life that I can control. And I'm not about to let anybody, care in a man can, Achi, whoever it is, deter me from that, that, that goal. I can't afford to let it happen. So as a result, I may now have, I may now come across to some people in some situations as being a bit cutthroat because if I sense negativity or drama and I don't see it's going to be conducive for where I'm trying to go, I'm not interested no more. And I never used to be like that. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? That's, that depends on how you look at it, you know? And I, when I was explaining it to my wife the other day, you know, she don't understand sometimes, like, you always work and you always work. And I'm saying, but babes, you have to understand something. I'm a cancer patient. You understand? I could, you know, it's, it's difficult having this conversation with my missus, you know? I could pass away. How are you gonna survive? I don't want you to have to marry another man in order for you you and the kids to, to be all right. You, you, you feel what I'm saying, Akhi? I, wanna have, I don't want you to have to go to Boris Johnson and put with your hand out and say that I want um, uh, handouts. I don't want to do that. I'm working hard now so that you guys can be good later. But she might say to me, but sometimes it's about the memories. What do I say to that? What good is, let's say for example, I build Mesa and Little Mesa up to a multi-million pound organization. She's good financially, but she's got no memories because the last portion of my life, I was just busy, busy, busy. So you feel like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. But at the end of the day, as, as, as a man, instinctively, I want to be the one to make my family okay. So that's why I work, Achi. I work like I'm going to die tomorrow. But I, I act like I'm going to live forever. You with me? Because I want them to be good. I said earlier that I had two questions, the last questions that I wanted to ask you. And, and uh, the first one was... Um, how life has been since your re-diagnosis in January. The second one, and this is probably the most personal one, and so I understand if you don't want to answer it, but my, my second one is the throughout this entire episode, um, you've taken breaks to mention that um, your wife has been like your rock and mm. that uh, you've made it seem like, um, obviously without Allah first, but without her, uh, you know, this would have been an extremely difficult process for you to have gone Facts. through and to still continue to go through. Um, can you shed some light on what it's meant to have your spouse if throughout this time throughout this time and continue yeah. to have i just be real with you Eke. i don't think i'll be here speaking to you now without my missus barakallahu fiha yeah. that's just the, that's just the reality of it uh, every every single married couple argue right you know the prophet is some he got upset with some of his wives during his time alayhi salam so um, I, I got a normal marriage and I told you that when I was going through the crux of it, I was really snappy and I wasn't nice to, to be around. She never, ever, 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 ever made me feel ugly. She had to wash me. I couldn't, like, she would have to hold me when I was in hospital, take me to the um, shower and wash me. And my legs, I lost all feelings from my knees down because I was just sitting in the bed all day. And I wouldn't wear those those special socks that they give you. She used to wash me. And when she would scrub my shins and I'd be in pain, I'd, be, I'd cry. I said, why, why? I'd be saying to her, why are you doing that? She would always just be patient and apologize. You with me? When I looked in the mirror, Aki, and I saw a skeleton and I saw, an, I didn't even like looking in the mirror no more. Not that I like looking in the mirror now, but at that time I didn't like looking at my mirror because I didn't recognize the person that was looking back at me. Right? Um, she was, she never made me feel ugly. She never made me feel any different to how the first time she made me feel like when we first got married. Do you know what I'm saying? So with somebody like 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 that in your corner, it's I, I couldn't even begin to express the gratitude uh, uh, for her. Even during the, the whole time I was in hospital, every single day, every single day, Ahi, she came to visit me. She might not have been able to stay for the whole day or a long time, but she just came to visit me just to see me quickly. I had four kids at the time. Remember that I had four kids. The eldest one, I believe, just got into uh, secondary school. I got my other one that's in a special needs school, um, and the other two, uh, one was out of school at the time, um, and the other one was uh, like just in primary school. She was still, who was still doing the kids' run. Alhamdulillah, she had support, a lot of support from her family, and may Allah bless them and my family, may Allah bless them. But ultimately, 
it's on her shoulder. She's getting up in the morning, doing the kids breakfast, getting them ready for school, dropping them to school, collecting them from school, making sure they do their homework, giving them dinner, sending them to oh, bed, and then coming woman. to deal with me. A different caliber, Achi. A different caliber. So now, like, even now that I feel like I'm better, how can I ever disrespect her? You with me? How can I? Because when I had nothing, she was still there every single day, saying to me, "Not everything's gonna be okay." But can you imagine? I never ever saw her cry once. Not saying that she's got like a hard heart, but she didn't want. She, she didn't want. It, she didn't want to be weak in front of me. I didn't know it at the time. I just wasn't even thinking about it. But she would cry, but not to me. Maybe to her sisters or to other relatives. But she was always strong for me, because she didn't want. She didn't want to. Um, she didn't want me to feel even worse. Do you know what I mean? Than I already did feel. Because I still did feel guilty. Like like I said a little while ago, what am I going to leave behind for my family? Like, I got nothing to give. Absolutely. I just come back from Medina. No money. No nothing. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I did a couple years in Medina, but there's so much more I want to give. You know, and I still feel to this day, inshallah ta'ala, I don't believe that the cancer is going to kill me. That's just me having personal dhan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't believe that. I think, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to live a long life, a long, healthy life. Um, uh, but needless to say, we still have to prepare and tie our camels, right? And that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to get the balance, trying to get the balance between working, leaving a legacy, creating something for my family, if the inevitable happens sooner than I expect it to happen, and at the same time, still creating those, those lovely... Uh, those lovely memories um you know actually just to digress actually I, I remember one time right i told you that when i had the stoma and i was in hospital i'd keep my curtains shut there was one guy who was across the road across the, the 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 bed from me right on in the middle i was by the window and he would always walk away with his top off walk, walk around so with his top off he had a couple of tattoos and stuff and i knew he was a cancer patient but um he was a bit older than me and he was quite like like a geezer type of type of vibe and um, I remember, like, because I was so just, you know, consumed with my own situation, when I would have to change my bag, I would just change it where I was. And that's what everybody does. Sometimes they, people bring it, they, nurses bring a chair for some of the patients to go number two in the chair. So imagine you're eating and all of a sudden you just smell somebody go, it's like, it's just really unpleasant. It's unpleasant. But I'm in my room and I'm thinking, I don't really smell. Make sure I've got an air freshener. If it, you know, I quickly change the bag and I just spray and I'm thinking I'm, I'm good and one vivid um, experience out of all of that that changed me for forever and it was the mindset again Nahi, and that's what I want to stress right the mindset I'm in my bed you know just not moving a much um, the it was my sub, but seven o'clock in the morning and it was about seven o'clock where we have breakfast and I would never really eat their food anyway it was just really unhealthy um, so I'm in my bed and I needed to change my bag. I needed to change my bag. So I proceeded to change my bag as I did every single day at any time that I wanted to during the whole month's period. And I don't know if he knew it was me, but I heard him start cussing. He was cussing. He was cussing the situation saying, this is disgusting. How can, how can people be changing their bags when I'm eating my food? I don't even wanna eat it. Like he was getting mad. And I felt so, attacked and insulted because I'm like I really felt like opening up the curtains and say bro do you think I want to be here do you think I want to be having to do this that's what I wanted to say but I didn't I just I just like just took it and internalized it and then I don't know what it was I just sat there and I was like wait a minute I wouldn't like it if somebody started changing their bag their stoma bag if I was eating and I said to myself I'm like you know what I'm going to get up, and every time I need to change my bag, I'm going to go to the toilet. It took me ages to walk, Achi. There's a video that's on my YouTube, on my Facebook. You see me walking, Achi. I was walking like a pigeon when I first had the surgery. And it, was, it took so much energy out of me to do it. So the first time I did it, I had my little, this little thing that I had, this, like, this rolly thing. I was holding on to, go to the toilet, change my bag, come back, get back in the bed, and I'm just, I'm scrubbed, I'm tired. And then... As I kept doing it, it kept getting easier and easier and easier. And then one day, it was a bright sunny day like today, I had my curtains open this day. I was feeling a bit good, you know, despite my, my circumstance. And he came to look out the window. 
and he's just maybe like drinking a cup of tea or whatever. And I wasn't really talking to him because like secretly I was upset, right? He yeah. helped me, but I was upset. Yeah. Like I'm like, just looking at him kind of like this kind of thing and cracking on. And then I don't know if he, he, he sparked conversation with me. I can't remember exactly what it happened, why we started speaking. But I said, look, mate, I want to I wanna say thank you. He's like, for what? I said, you know when you said this the other day? And I, I narrated to him what happened. And I told him how I felt. And I said that as a result of you saying what you said, whilst I didn't like it and it felt really uncomfortable for me, I've been getting out of my bed and walking. And, you know, I had hope after that. And it was strange that, again, from a situation that, I wouldn't expect to be the source of my strength, you know, being ins insulted. It ended up becoming the source of my strength. Actually, I leave you with one story, one story. When you're in the hospital and you're, 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 you're um, going to be sitting down for a long period of time, they have to give you these like aeroplane socks to help with the circulation of your blood so you don't get blood clots. So you don't, you know, end up dying. So they would give me the, the socks. I wouldn't wear it. They would say, All right, Chris, you have to get up and walk around, I wouldn't, you know, um, and then some days I would, depending on how I felt, so I would have to literally get the nurse to hold, help, hold my hand, because my your balance goes, and you're, you know, I was walking like this, like an old man, so on one occasion, one nurse said, all right, Mr. Bowman, you're getting up today, you're going for a walk, and I'm like, all right, cool, so I said, can you get me like a, um, a Zimmer frame, <laughs> she was like, nope, and I'm like, Oh, it's, a, it's a bit, it's a bit shady, you know. Um, she goes, "You're gonna do it by yourself." I said, right, "Can you at least hold my hand?" She's like, "Nope." I'm like, "I'm kind of feeling to go back, sit down on my bed right now. Like, help me a little bit. Like, let's meet me halfway." So then I started walking, and what they would do, they would get you to walk around just the circuit of the um, the the ward. So what happened that is like I was walking, 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 and I'm nearly, I've nearly made a lap. Right, I'm nearly, I'm, I'm nearly made a home run and I was really close to the wall because obviously my balance so as I was walking I lost my balance and I was leaning on the wall like this 45 kg at, at that remember Echi. right now I'm about 73 so I'm, I'm much yeah. much yeah I'm so still healthy weight Echi. <laughs> praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, 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 five, for, for five foot a little, a little bit that's, that's good, <laughs> that's do you know good. what I'm saying but can you imagine me at this little five foot nothing being 45, 46 kg? I was just like, like the wind could have come and blown me over. So I leant on the wall like this and I goes to her. I was, I was doing this with my other arm to say, like, grip me so you can pull me up. You know what she said to me? She goes, no, nah, do it yourself. And I couldn't understand at the time, why are you being so mean? But she wasn't. She was giving me strength. Aki. The moment I went like this, I lifted up myself off the wall. I said, right, I can do it. Mm. It was here. It was all up here. And I, I can't remember her face, but I remember how she made me feel. You know, when I had the storm, Akhi, three months, I never made sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I still prayed. I still prayed, Akhi. Three months, I never made sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. in the, 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 the traditional way that we make sajda on your forehead and your nose and your hands. <laughs> I would simply pray on a bed or pray on a chair and I'd just do this, you know, just to uh, make an ishara with my body. So, um, the first time I went to the Masjid Akhi, Al Karim, after this whole episode, and I still had the stoma bag on me, but it's like I'm trying, I'm getting used to when it goes now. When, it, when, it, when it's active, I kind of know as soon as I eat, then it's active. So, if I don't eat anything, then I'm good for a couple of hours. So, I went to the Masjid now, I've walked in. I created an ICT and I'm so conscious because the last vision that people had of me was the Imam giving the khutbah, giving lessons. Now I'm coming in, I'm dressed in a trackie and a top, I'm skinny, got this stoma bag on and I'm just thinking quickly, Ismail, pray, sit down, be incognito kind of thing. I had a little woolly hat on as well. And in that whole, you know, that the, the mix of all of that, I just found a space to pray. And I said, Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, I kid you not, Akhi. I kid you not. The moment I made the takbir, it's as almost as if the shaitan come to me and said, you forgot your chair. Ha ha, you forgot your chair. And I'm like, in my head now, okay, do I break my salah? But if I break my salah, people are going to start saying, what's he doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, there was too many things that were going on in my crazy little head, or crazy big head, should I say, at the, at the time. 
And I said, no, you know what? I'm going to just continue. And then it was, yeah, I continued, continued. And then it was when I came back from the Rukur and I was going into Sajda, I feel like tears filled up in my eyes. Because I said to myself, the first time in three months, Akhi, that I was almost deprived of myself. Because the reality of the matter is I could do it. I could do it because I did it. I was just telling myself, because you're sick, because you've got the stomach bag, because you've been this and that, you can't do it. And that's a message that I want to get. I really want this to, to hit home with people that, you know, don't, 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 um, don't limit yourself. You know, believe in yourself. And not everything has to be uh, doom and gloom. There could be something beautiful um, that's waiting on the other side. Even if it's not materialistic, Achi, or in terms of popularity or anything like that. If, 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 if a traumatic situation, Achi, or, a, a, you know, a, um, um, some type of pain causes you to be a better person, it causes you to be more sympathetic or empathetic, it causes you to be more caring about other people, it changes you as a person, it ultimately brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I still got a long way to go, but I'm better than I was yesterday. Are you with me? I think that's what we should focus on and that's what we should, we should celebrate on. Uh, celebrate. And as I mentioned in a, um, a YouTube uh, video that I put out recently, don't always connect yourselves to your accolades because whatever you achieve and those things that you do manage to acquire, be idhni lay ta'ala, are just that things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to acquire. you right. Not, not by any, um, um, you know, special gift of your own. You've been given these things. And the reason I say that is because of this. Uh, if you always get attached to your accolades and the things that you've achieved and it makes you feel better once you do it, then subsequently when you start to fail, when you get sick, when you get ill, when a loved one passes away and you're attached to whether you succeed or fail, now you're going to start to go in, in a dump, down in the dumps. You're going to start to feel down in the dumps. My thing is, let's try to learn from our experiences whether they're good or bad learn from them if you fail at something it doesn't mean you're necessarily bad at it it just needs you need to work a bit harder or you need to try something different you with me if you succeed in something it's not because you're a fantastic person it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the tawfiq to be successful in that thing and it's getting that balance if you become sick you're not a bad person if you lose a whole bunch of money you're not a stupid person yeah you can make stupid decisions and stuff like that but don't allow it to change who you are uh, as a person. That's what I'm trying to, um, that's the message that I want to say, my brother. Um, I, I, I want to say something, but um, before I do say it, in case I, I, I shut off, I'm going to say that my camera, I think it's going through an overheating process so it might switch off in a second. In I'm fact, sorry, let me try and, no, 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 let me try and, let me try and adjust it. it quickly. No, 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 I'll try, I'll try and adjust it quickly. Okay, alhamdulillah, I've managed to uh, save it for now. Uh, Aki, I wanted to say this. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say barakallahu fikum for joining us on Freshly Grounded, Aki, um, for being for, for deciding to share your story on this platform to our listeners. And um, I, I ask sincerely that Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, Aki, um, grants you complete shifa. And he is capable of all things. For Allah is kun fayakun. And so we should always, as you know, uh, you are subhanAllah our teacher, Akhi, uh, for as you know more than uh, us, he is capable of all things. And um, I also want to, I want to give a message to the people, but I don't want you to listen to it. So I want your amana that you won't listen to the end of the, this, 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 this episode. Inshallah ta'ala. I mean, and yeah, what? inshallah, inshallah. You're going you're gonna to mute me now, yeah? I'm going to mute you for a second. Do you think, bro? Do you think? Wow, Brothers and sisters, uh, Jazakallah khair if you made it to the end of this podcast. I really, really hope that you did. And, and I want to say one thing. I want to say that our brother right now he has cancer. And uh, he's very, very positive. Uh, his attitude is very, very positive. And he's doing so much khair. And I ask for you guys to do one thing for me. And I never, I would never, and I never have before, uh, and I try my best not to publicize <laughs> what I'm going to do because I hope uh, I I in terms of act of worship I try my best not to uh, the ones especially ones that are private with Allah but I think that there is khair in me doing it now and I would say that I'm that we can all benefit this brother we can all benefit our brother our teacher he's a graduate uh, from, from 10 years ago from the University of Medina someone we can all benefit from our children are benefiting from and I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for you guys to go out of your way to do anything uh, subhanAllah crazy. But I'm asking you for something that is worth more than money. 
And um, and that thing that I'm asking, I'm just making sure that's still on mute, that is worth more than money, brothers and sisters, is that as you're listening to this, that you make an intention for your brother, for Allah's sake, after listening to this episode, to just pull yourself out of bed tomorrow morning, whenever you're listening to this. Whenever you listen to this, the next morning. And as it stands right now, Fajr happens at 4.43 in London. And so I'm going to set my alarm right now with you guys. Inshallah, in fact, uh, uh, maybe I can turn it off the video for a second. Yeah, I can. I'm going to set my alarm. Fajr happens at 4.43. And I'm going to say I want to wake up at 4.25, just 15 minutes pretty much, before Fajr. There you go. My alarm is set. You can see I got one for 4.45 and I had one for 5.50. 5.50 was my original one. And I'm going to say, brothers and sisters, I'm going to, inshallah, if Allah gives me the ability to, I'm going to try and sleep a bit early today and I'm going to try and wake up uh, tomorrow for tahajjud and raise my hands and I ask that you guys raise your hands and all you do is not give, not, I'm not asking for anything other than you raise your hands and you make sincere dua to Allah for this brother at a time where in the last part of the night. And, um, Barakallahu feek brothers and sisters I'm going to have to cut it here Because the, 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 the camera's about to cut out Thank you so much for listening to this episode And uh, we'll see you again Inshallah on Monday